Good afternoon. We will now resume agenda item 11, the high level segment. And it is my pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Jorge Pedro Mauricio dos Santos, uh, Minister of uh, Communities of uh, Capo Verde. Capo Verde, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président, euh, Madame et Monsieur les Ministres, Madame la Directrice Générale de l'OIM, Honorable Chef de Délégation, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais d'abord féliciter Madame Amy Pop pour son élection en tant que première femme dans l'histoire de l'Organisation internationale pour l'immigration, OIM, a occupé le poste important de directeur général. Nous lui souhaitons beaucoup de succès dans ses nobles fonctions à la tête de cette importante organisation. Comptez sur le Cap Vert pour relever ses défis. Madame Amy Pop. Je voudrais également de féliciter Madame l'ambassadeur d'Allemagne pour son élection en tant que la présidente de ce Conseil. Monsieur le Président, c'est un honneur pour moi d'être ici pour discuter d'un sujet d'une importance croissante dans notre monde contemporain. Les interactions complexes entre la migration et le changement climatique. À l'heure actuelle, en particulier au cours des dernières décennies, ces phénomènes de changement climatique sont à l'ordre du jour et ont entraîné des conséquences néfastes sur la vie des millions de personnes, des peuples, les obligeant à abandonner leurs terres, familles et communautés à la recherche de meilleures conditions de survie. Cabo Verde est un état insulaire sur l'océan Atlantique, Atlantique moyenne. C'est un pays de revenus moyens. C'est un pays caractérisé comme pays d'immigration. Son territoire physique s'étend sur 4033 km carrés avec une zone économique exclusivement maritime de presque 800 000 km carrés. Ça veut dire que notre pays est 96 de mer. Il compte une population de 2 millions d'habitants, dont 25 vivant sur les îles et 75 dans la diaspora, répartie dans le plus de 25 pays d'Afrique, Amérique, principalement, principalement à les États-Unis. Europe, Asie et même à l'Océanie. Les contributions économiques directes et indirectes de la, de la diaspora capverdienne sont importantes et significatives pour le pays et représentent aujourd'hui environ 34% du produit interne brut national, dépassant l'aide publique au développement et le total des investissements directs étrangers. C'est une question de secteur privé. La diaspora capverdien, c'est le secteur privé. Cabo Verde est un pays sahélien avec une immigration spontanée, forcée par les phénomènes climatiques caractérisés par des sécheresses sévères et récurrents qui sont à l'origine des différentes phases des flux migratoires vers l'étranger. Les fins du 19e siècle est le point de référence 
des flux migratoires capverdiens vers les États-Unis, où les capverdiens se consacrent à la, à la pêche de baleines, sans négliger d'autres courantes qui ont eu pour destination des pays, des pays africains et l'Amérique du Sud. Malgré l'insuffisance des pluies, les déséquilibres de la production agricole et au manque des ressources naturelles, la situation économique et sociale du pays s'est progressivement améliorée grâce à des mesures de politique publique, en mettant accent sur les politiques publiques de, de protection de l'environnement et des réformes de sa politique migratoire. La migration est incluse dans le plan stratégique de développement durable et du Cap Vert, avec des mesures visant à promouvoir une migration sûre, régulière et circulaire. Le Cap Vert prêtait une attention particulière aux immigrants résidents dans le pays. Nous sommes aussi un pays d'immigration. En mettant l'accent sur des mesures d'inclusion, d'intégration et de la lutte contre les inégalités sociales. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Directeure générale, L'émigration de masse auxquelles nous, nous assistons pour des raisons climatiques ne sont pas seulement soumises à des risques humanitaires, mais également d'autres risques qui menacent la sécurité physique des migrants. Nous référons concrètement aux risques associés au trafic des personnes et à toute criminalité qui y est alliée. Il est essentiel de trouver des solutions internes, régionales, multilatérales pour contenir ces phénomènes. Également, des mesures préventives de renforcement de la résilience s'imposent en veillant ou en minimisant la, le, les risques d'émigration de masse. Et Cap Verde souhaite participer activement à ce dialogue en vue de trouver des solutions pour apporter sa longue expérience en tant que pays d'immigration, mais aussi d'écouter d'autres qui peuvent contribuer à renforcer l'efficacité des politiques que les pays développent. Également, nous défendons que l'immigration circulaire, sûre, régulière, bien gérée, sont effectivement bénéfiques pour l'individu, la communauté, les localités et les pays bénéficiaires. Cap Vert, c'est un exemple. C'est pourquoi le gouvernement de Cap Vert considère la diaspora comme une ressource stratégique et endogène pour le développement économique, social et culturel de notre pays. L'intégration et l'engagement des, des, des migrants dans les pays d'accueil sont donc d'une importance capitale. Pour conclure, je voudrais réaffirmer que le Cap Vert a adopté des politiques publiques visant à promouvoir le capital humain et, des, et les investissements économiques et financiers de la diaspora et l'engagement de celle-ci de tous les, les secteurs du développement du pays. Je, je voudrais euh, remercier votre attention. Merci à tous. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Her Excellency. Ms. Caroline uh, Guinness, Minister of Development Cooperation and of Major Cities of Belgium. Belgium, you have the floor. Dear Chair, Director of General Excellencies, 
around the world, the consequences of climate crisis are already having major impacts. Those who are most vulnerable have to carry the heaviest burden. For this reason, as a Minister of International Solidarity, supporting our partners to prepare for and adapt to climate change is one of my absolute top priorities. As we all know, climate change has an impact on people's movements and migration. The environment and climate in which people live has always played a role in people's decisions to migrate. However, as the IPCC recognized, climate change now has an aggravating impact and multiplier effect on migration in Africa, Asia and the Pacific. More political efforts are needed to lead us to more innovative solutions. First of all, more action is needed to address the climate crisis itself. The Belgian Development Corporation is currently working on a new strategy for its climate action. It will take a cross-cutting approach that calls on all Belgian actors to play a part in our response to the challenges caused by climate change in the broader context of the triple planetary crisis, climate, biodiversity, pollution. Our vision is to strengthen international cooperation and solidarity to work towards a safe and healthy planet for all. Belgium wants to contribute to the sustainable improvement of the well-being of vulnerable populations, particularly in the least developed countries with a focus on Africa. Belgium will help boost resources for adaptation measures responding to the needs and requests of its partner countries. Secondly, to help address the climate crisis, policy coherence for sustainable development is key. We will make sure that the climate strategy is complementary to our strategy on migration and development. By mainstreaming migration and integrating it into the policies, strategies and programs of the Belgian Development Corporation, significant results can be achieved. We aim to promote the potential of migration for sustainable development and at the same time to contribute to climate change adaptive solutions. Thirdly, we need action on the ground. Various projects implemented by our development agency, Enabel, contribute to making people and communities in our partner countries more resilient against the adverse consequences of climate change. Professional mobility is used to develop and exchange climate innovative solutions and skills to address climate-induced migration. Other programs dealing with fragility or agriculture, like in Burkina Faso and Niger, address climate-induced migration and the impact of displacement on the environment. Lastly, it is necessary to intensify discussions on how we can better manage migration so it doesn't further increase the vulnerability, vulnerabilities of both the people migrating and of host communities. Discussions on regular pathways are needed to respond to sudden changes in the environment. So, all in all, much to talk about. I would like to thank IOM for organizing this timely discussion and wish you a fruitful debate. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move on, I, I'd like to remind the delegates to limit uh, their statement to five minutes. Okay, I'll give the floor to uh, the Honorable uh, Dr. Vindia Pasaud, Minister of Human Services and Social Security of Guyana. Guyana, you have the floor. Esteemed colleagues, Director General, Chair, thank you. It is timely that the global call for solutions to the climate impact on human mobility is the focus of this year's high-level event. It is also noteworthy that the Director General's report highlighted that migration due to weather-related disaster now exceeds that caused by conflict and violence. Developing countries, small island developing states, and low-lying coastal states like Guyana have viewed climate change as an existential threat to our survival for years. It is envisaged that climate change-induced migration will have implications on international peace and security. 
Hence, Guyana having a non-permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council for the period 2024 to 2025 will advance the issues of climate change, food insecurity, and conflict within the Security Council from a small island developing state perspective. A tangible solution would be to implement and support the sustainable development goals, but developing countries need access to concessionary financing and official development assistance to aid in climate change mitigation efforts, even as they endeavor to get their economies back on track after the disastrous effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and to build resilience against future shocks. There is need for political consensus towards bold action backed by direct climate finance, not repurposed funds, to impact adaptation mitigation efforts against the climate crisis and its role in causing involuntary migration. Guyana has consistently made the call for support to those small developing countries that are disproportionately affected by the vagaries of climate change. In this regard, the IOM can be instrumental in developing the appropriate response in collaboration with states. The government of Guyana's committal to a green economy and policies which support this vision include the 2030 Low Carbon Development Strategy, the second national communication to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the National Integrated Disaster Risk Management Plan, and the National Adaptation Strategy to address climate change in the agricultural sector and the sea and river defense policy. Guyana has pioneered an overarching framework for planning and implementing climate resilience actions in several areas, including human mobility, through its LCDS 2030, which prioritizes the implementation of Guyana Climate Resilience Strategy and Action Plan, and made interventions to the drainage, irrigation, and sea defense systems to reduce the risk of flooding. Guyana has access external finance to support the implementation of these actions from several sources, including through the Memorandum of Understanding with the Government of Norway, the European Union, and multilateral arrangements. Through the recent sale of forest carbon credits, earning Guyana 150 million US dollars in 2023, a significant percentage of these resources have gone towards strengthening Guyana's climate adaptation system. Guyana's flagship LCDS 2030 will not reverse the climate damage already done to the environment by major polluters, nor reduce involuntary migration caused by the climate crisis now. But this model, which will be shared with the world at the upcoming 28th United Nations Climate Change Conference, where the stakes could not be higher, provides the robust bridge needed to ensure that the planet, our only home, wins. In the face of rising sea levels, devastating natural disasters and dwindling resources, extreme weather conditions, food and water insecurities, changes in disease transmissions and vector ecology, we must recognize that the consequences of climate change are not confined to a single region nor a specific group of people. They reverberate across continents, displacing communities, uprooting lives, leaving countless individuals in search of safety and stability. In conclusion, it is hoped that this high-level segment ensures that climate crisis stays in focus as it is now the leading cause of involuntary migration. This global phenomenon knows no borders, respects no boundaries, and affects all of us. It is a crisis that requires a unified response that transcends individual nations. We cannot ignore the moral imperative that lies before us. It is time to forge a global solution that addresses the root causes of climate-induced migration. I thank you. Thank you. Now I give, uh, give the floor to Her Excellency. Ms. Lissje Schreiner-Marker, Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation of Kingdom of Netherlands. Netherlands, you have the floor. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen,
Let me begin by congratulating the new Director General, Amy Pope. Amy, you're IOM's first female DG and it was about time. I commend you for setting clear priorities, particularly on accountability and transparency. And I encourage you to use the MOPAN recommendations to the fullest for achieving these. Congratulations are also in order for the impact achievement through the COMPASS initiative. The IOM, the Netherlands and 14 partner countries have made significant contributions here. To protect migrants, to counter human trafficking and migrant smuggling and to facilitate voluntary return and reintegration. There are three points I'd like to make today. First, the Netherlands remains committed for a second phase of COMPASS. With a greater focus on structural solutions to improve the protection of people on the move. A contribution of 100 million euros for the next four years reflects our strong dedication to the program's continued success. And to IOM as an institution. Second, I want to applaud IOM's work on climate mobility. Amy, as you said at the International Dialogue on Migration, we need solutions for people to move, for people on the move and for people to stay. The Netherlands welcomes IOM's strategic leadership on this issue. And over the coming years, climate finance and adaptation must be scaled up. We need to strengthen people's resilience to climate crises through prevention and preparedness. Third, we applaud IOM's ambition to develop innovative migration solutions in close collaboration with UNHCR. We believe that to reduce irregular migration and make safe, orderly and regular migration possible, new forms of collaboration are needed. So to conclude, the Netherlands encourages IOM to continue its current efforts and we look forward to continue our cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. I give the floor to uh, Mr. Tobias Lindner, a Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Germany, you have the floor. Chair, Director General, Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The climate crisis is the global challenge of our time. We see a global increase in hazards and disasters related to climate change, leading to new displacements of millions of people every year. Today, more than 3 billion people live in regions that are highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The destruction of the environment and of natural resources endangers human and international security. It exacerbates conflicts over ever scarcer resources, such as water and food, forcing people to flee their homes. Women and girls experience the greatest impacts of climate change, which amplifies existing gender inequalities and poses unique threats to their livelihoods, health and safety. Last year, more than half of the international displacements were triggered by disasters such as floods, storms or droughts. Disaster displacements in 2022 were 41 percent higher than the annual average of the decade before. Concrete, more than 30 million people not only lost their homes due to weather-related events, they lost much more economic security, community and maybe whole cultures, not to speak about the physical and mental health impacts of such a traumatic event. This is why we need the International Organization of Migration more than ever to help families who get displaced because they lost their homes in contexts of disasters and climate change. To act as far as possible in a preventive manner, IOM is gathering and analyzing data that is needed to anticipate needs in order to act early on with targeted interventions, to help people adapt, mitigate the effects of crisis and prevent displacement. We very much appreciate that Director General Pope is making climate and migration one of her priorities. We stand ready to support this approach. We have committed to strengthening anticipatory action, for example, in the context of climate-induced disasters and conflicts. We have committed ourselves to use at least 5% of our overall humanitarian budget for anticipatory action, and we encourage partners to do the same. 
This is why we are glad that Germany and IOM jointly set up the Global Emergency Response Program, which allows for flexible funding to be used in an anticipatory manner. In this context, we stress the importance of flexible funding for crisis response for IOM's ability to react quickly. We also support the platform on disaster displacement to advance the protection agenda of people displaced across borders in the context of disasters and climate change. And we will also be advocating for climate policy and action to be inclusive of refugees and other forcibly displaced people and their host communities following the Global Refugee Forum in December 2023. At the same time, we have to increase our mitigation effort to lower the risks of climate change. Reducing emissions is an important tool to prevent conflicts and to prevent displacement. Going forward, we also need a better understanding of the dynamics of displacement and migration movements, especially in the context of climate change. In that respect, the systematic collection, analysis and use of relevant data is key. The establishment of IOM's Global Data Institute here in Berlin is very timely in that regard, and we are glad to support the GDI substantially. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now I uh, give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Taulant Bala, Minister of Interior of Albania. Albania, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed members of the IOM Council, I am honored to stand before you today with a profound gratitude for the opportunity to address this esteemed Council on the critical matter of the intersection of climate change and human mobility. This is an issue of paramount significance that necessitates our collective attention, compassion and decisive action. I commend the International Organization for Migration for its firm commitment to addressing the challenges posed by climate-induced migration. I wish to emphasize the fruitful partnership between the Albanian government and IOM Albania in tackling migration challenges. Our joint initiatives spanning from direct support for migrants to the formulation and implementation of migration strategies, diaspora, engagement, capacity building, programs for our administration and awareness campaigns have yielded many positive outcomes. These efforts highlight the power of cooperation in finding sustainable solutions crucial in navigating the complexities of migration challenges, especially those exacerbated by the changing climate. The interconnection between climate change and human mobility is undisputable, impacting us all and affecting vulnerable populations. In Albania, where environmental shifts have broad consequences. This connection is particularly poignant. Despite having among the lowest greenhouse gas emissions in the region, Albania is identified by the World Bank as the Europe's most vulnerable country from climate change effects. Recent years have witnessed increasing temperatures disproportional and have rainfall and more frequent extreme weather events such as floods and droughts. In the country, projected sea level rise poses threats of higher flood and coastal erosion, affecting urban areas along the coast, arable land and coastal habitats. Key vulnerable sectors include agriculture, energy, health and tourism that count for more than 70% of the national GDP, influencing thus the overall economic development of the country. Albania's national strategy on migration stands as a testament to our commitment to integrating climate change, 
considerations into our policies, provisions have been made to address the climate-induced aspects of human mobility, acknowledging the significant role climate change plays as a push factor for migration. Furthermore, Albania serves as a transit country for thousands of migrants each year with climate changes impacting the migration decisions of many. These considerations built on our national strategy for development and integration, recognizing the profound impacts of climate change on various sectors of the economy, the alignment of development goals with climate resilience underscores the importance of sustainable practices in mitigating the challenges related to climate-induced migration. The Albanian government has established a robust legal framework in response to climate change, adopting key documents such as the law on climate change, the strategy for climate change, with a specific chapter on adaptation, the revised determined national contribution, and the National Energy and Climate Plan 2020-2030. This reflects our international commitments to emissions reduction targets and measures to protect the country from the effects of climate change, particularly focusing on the coastal areas until 2030. Our goal is to mobilize financial and other resources necessary to protect Albania from the effects of climate change, transitioning to a climate resilience development path with net zero emissions. Through this integrated approach, we strive to create a future where development and climate considerations create synergies for the benefit of all. Nevertheless, challenges persist and international cooperation is more crucial than ever. It is imperative that we acknowledge these challenges and seek cooperation with all nations by sharing best practices, enhancing capacity and building resilience. We can collectively address the complex dynamics of climate-related mobility. In the spirit of collaboration, I call upon the international community to recognize the urgency of a coordinated global response. Climate-induced migration exceeds borders and our solutions must reflect this reality. Albania stands ready to work hand in hand with our regional partners in the Western Balkans, as well as with the global community. Increased support, both in terms of financial assistance and knowledge sharing, is essential for implementing effective solutions. In conclusion, I want to reaffirm Albania's unwavering commitment to addressing the challenges posed by climate change on human mobility. The path ahead may be challenging, but through continued collaboration, information sharing, and the development of innovative solutions, we can protect vulnerable populations affected by climate-induced migration. On this journey, we are together for the sake of a sustainable and resilient future for all. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Now I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Nibras Tali, CEO of Labor Market Regulatory Authority of Bahrain. Bahrain, you have the floor. Chairperson of the Council, Director General and Deputy Director General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. 
Mr. Chairperson, allow me first to express my warmest congratulations to Director General Pope on her recent election. The Kingdom of Bahrain looks forward to working closely with Director General Pope over the course of our tenure. Now against the backdrop of the impact that climate change is having on human mobility, well-managed migration has emerged as a crucial enabler for achieving sustainable development. We are seeing that new climate realities are forcing people to move to find safe and dignified livelihoods in many parts of the world. At the same time, labor landscapes across the globe are shifting to respond to the new possibilities arising around innovative green solutions. And the Kingdom of Bahrain is no exception. As a significant labor destination country, the Kingdom of Bahrain has for years welcomed expats workers to its shores. We are proud of the diversity in our labor market and country, and we are proud of our contributions to the sustainable development of dozens of countries of origin around the world. Bahrain has long been a pioneer with respect to the protection and empowerment of expert workers. In addition to expansive labor reform, including on labor market mobility, we have taken steps to promote ethical recruitment to not only reduce the vulnerabilities of workers, but to also to support employers in being able to recruit informed and prepared workers to their workplaces. Now, recognizing the challenges faced by workers in irregular situations, we have also pioneered creative solutions to provide access to regularization and the labor market, including through promoting flexible work arrangements that reflect the changing nature of work. With this, we look forward to continuing to consider approaches to labor migration governance, prioritization, innovation, agility, and partnerships. In this effort, the government of Bahrain is taking a whole of society approach, working closely with the private sector to create an environment where talent is nurtured and skills are honed. We recognize the sustainable solutions cannot be achieved unilaterally. By actively engaging with the private sector, we are fostering a col collaborative ecosystem that harnesses the strengths of both the public and private entities to achieve the sustainable development goals and the objectives of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Mr. Chairperson, as elsewhere, the labor market in the Kingdom of Bahrain is evolving. We are seeing and also fully anticipating a growing demand for workers of all skills across both traditional and emerging sectors. We are, in other words, building the workforce of the future. The workforce that we must equip with the knowledge and expertise to pioneer innovative solutions, also in the face of climate change. Now, to meet this challenge, we plan to work closely with partners, both at home as well as beyond our borders. We believe that well-managed migration can provide win-win solutions for all, workers, employers, as well as governments of both countries of origin and countries of destination. And in conclusion, I would like to take this opportunity once again to thank IOM for its critical role in strengthening international cooperation on migration. We look forward to continuing the close working relationship with the IOM and further innovative whole of society solutions to meeting the labor needs of the future. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Ilva Johansson, European Commissioner for Home Affairs, European Union. You have the floor. Good morning. Let me tell you about Hua. Hua is from Cameroon. There she lived with her people. The rains started falling less and less. The land became drier and drier. And the people had to take their cattle further and further away to drink. Until they came to an area with streams. Streams used by another people for fishing. It started with name-calling. Soon there were physical violence. It ended with murder. Houses and people burned, women and children killed. Who have fled the violence along with 30,000 others? 
Climate change brings storms, floods, disasters. Disasters bring poverty, misery, hunger. Hunger brings conflict, violence, war. So it's time to start talking about climate change and migration. Drought in the Horn of Africa caused displacement of nearly 3 million people. Floods in Pakistan forced 10 million people on the move. Wildfires displace 150,000 people in France, Germany, Italy and Spain. Last year, 32 million people became internally displaced because of floods, storms, droughts and wildfires. Climate change will make things worse. Today, around 3.5 billion people live in areas at high risk of climate change. Asia and Africa are especially exposed. Rising sea levels could put between 10 and 100 million people at risk of displacement. And the world's most fragile areas are most at risk. The World Bank predicts climate change could displace more than 200 million people by 2050. We must address the causes of climate change and effects of climate change. The causes with the Green Deal, the EU's ambitious climate package. And we must empower people to help them adapt to the changing climate. The European Union supports the most affected regions with targeted relief and by fostering strategies to help people adapt. We were one of the first to set up big programs on climate change and displacement, for example in Somalia. And we are the world's biggest donor of climate finance. 30% of our development and cooperation funds support climate goals. One third of global public climate finance comes from the European Union and its member states. And we need to counter irregular migration and promote instead regular migration. Today, we present proposals for new EU rules to step up the fight against smugglers. I'm not with you in person because, as we speak, I'm hosting a conference to strengthen global efforts against smugglers. And I'm working to improve legal pathways for migration. All of our societies need green skills to cope with climate change. Skills to design, build and repair solar panels and wind turbines. In my home country, Sweden, there are severe shortages of skilled people to produce the batteries needed in electric cars. Upskilling and reskilling is necessary, but will not be enough. We also need migration. As part of our overall strategic migration management, we are building talent partnerships with key countries. And two weeks ago, I launched a talent pool so people can come to Europe to learn new skills and EU companies can find skilled staff from abroad. To the IOM I say, thank you for putting climate change on the global migration agenda. It's also high on the EU agenda. This year we organized a major conference on climate and, and migration and shared the platform on disaster displacement. We can only manage migration together. We can only tackle climate change together. We need to put climate change at the heart of our cooperation on migration. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Augusto de Aruda Botelho, National Secretary of Justice of Brazil. Brazil, you have the floor. Mr. Chair, Mrs. Director General, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be here today and to address this Council on behalf of the Brazilian government. Let me start by congratulating the new Director General, Amy Pope, for her election at a critical moment for human displacement. My government has confidence in her leadership and it's ready to contribute to the success of her mandate. I would like to express my appreciation for IOM's work in Brazil. Your office in Brasilia has become 
an essential partner of the government, and especially of the Ministry of Justice and Public Security in the implementation of several programs and initiatives in favor of migrants, especially within the framework of Operation Welcome. Mr. Chair, Brazil firmly believes migration can generate economic, social, and cultural benefits for societies. We are proud to be a country built by migrants. Men and women from all continents brought to Brazil their culture, values, expertise, and knowledge, enriching our culture and bringing dynamis to many sectors. We are convinced that migration is not a threat, but rather an opportunity. While we recognize the legitimate concerns of hosting countries and communities, no challenge can justify managing migration outside the framework of international human rights law. Brazil is particularly concerned with the increasing trend to criminalize migrants, as well as reports of abuse in detention procedures and expulsions. We reiterate once more our commitment to the promotion of the human rights of all migrants, regardless of migratory status, and we put our words in action. Brazil's migration law, adopted in 2017, is based on the principle of equal treatment and opportunity without any kind of discrimination. In this vein, I would like to highlight Brazil's return to the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, a commitment President Lula made during the transition phase of his administration. I would also like to mention the progress already made in this first year, such as the regulation for granting temporary visas and residence permits for citizens of the member of the community of Portuguese speaking languages. Also important to mention, Brazil's participation in the Quito process. As National Secretary of Justice, I am responsible for Brazil's migration policy. And in, in these first days of my administration, I was given a task to build the national policy on migration, refugees, and stateliness. In an unprecedented move, for months, we brought together 13 government ministries more than 200 civil society organizations, international bodies dealing with this issue, and leading academics, experts to build this policy. More than 1,400 written contributions were submitted, which now have been analyzed and compiled in the first text of the new national policy that will soon be presented to everyone. Uh, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this section, the climate impact on human mobility, if, is of greatest importance. Deeply committed to the fight against climate change, Brazil has offered to host COP30 in the Amazonian city of Belém in 2025. Brazil shares IOM concern with the climate impact on human mobility. In response, our migration law has provided a legal basis for granting humanitarian visas to individuals affected by natural disasters. This policy has benefited nations such as Haiti since 2012, with more than 900,000 visas granted to this day. However, we consider that projections on the so-called climate mobility must take into the account that climate interacts with social, political, and economic drivers when it comes to migration. The IPCC considers climate-related migration patent difficult to project. How and when climate change leads to increased migration remains poorly understood. Push factors driving migration may include a combination of trends and events, including poverty and un unemployment, limited livelihood opportunities, and decent work deficits, relative deprivation, persecution, and discrimination, violent conflicts, natural disasters, and famine.
Some of these factors can be exacerbated by climate change, but different communities facing similar environment pressures on livelihoods that not necessarily adopt the same migration patterns. Climate change should not, however, take precedence over known more relevant and immediate causes of migration, such as inequality between and within countries, social economic exclusion, poverty, political instabilities, and armed conflicts. If, on the one hand, it is recognized that the effects of climate changes are serious and deserve the attention of the international community, on the other hand, there is concern about the possible hauling out of the migration agenda and the consequent redirection of scarce international resources to programs and projects with limited practical impact on the national migration responses. Mr. Chair, I finalize by saying Brazil's concern about the continued deaths and recruitment of migrants by coyotes who risk their lives in dangerous crossings such as the Darien Strait. We believe that the global response must be coordinated with international support for national responses to the reception and integration of migrants in developing countries. We must all put our efforts to an improved dialogue on the need to provide adequate protection for the human rights of all migrants regardless of the migratory status with an end, a definitive end to the criminalization of migration. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Abdullah uh, Mobini, Deputy Minister of Interior and Head of the National Organization of Migration of Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran, you have the floor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I raised origin of one wizard of a name in the Goni Muhtaram. Ibtida is a Hamote, Sazmone, Benun Mali, Mohajerat, Paroye, Tashkile, Nishasta, Ali Rutve, Darhose, Tasir, Tahir, Eklim, Barjabujoi, Kabdoni Mikona. Hover me on ever Arab Osio, Dar Hafta He was a Shayek as Konun Hoye, Bijo Shudigida, Johan Buddhas. آخرین نمونه آن آوارگی فاجعه بار ناشی از جنگ غزه است بر اساس گزارش دفتر هماهنگی های بشر دوستانه سازمان ملل این جنگ در مدت 50 روز به بی خانمان شدن و آوارگی بیش از یک میلیون و 800 هزار شهروند بیگنا انجامیده است در چنین وضعیتی مسئولیت جامعه بین المللی برای کاهش آلام مردم غزه دو چندان خواهد بود علاوه بر چنین بحران‌های دست ساخته بشر غرب آسیا جز مناطقی است که به شدت تحت تاثیر پیامدهای تغییر اقلیم و بلایای طبیعی بوده است سالانه صدها هزار نفر در این منطقه به دلیل تاثیر مخاطرات طبیعی مجبور به ترک محل سکونت و یا کشور خود می‌شوند جمهوری اسلامی ایران نیز از جمله کشورهایی است که تأثیر زیادی از پیامدهای تغییر اقلیم و بلایای طبیعی از جمله خشکسالی، زلزله، سیل پذیرفته است. ایجاد بیقاعده صد و عدم تأمین حق آبه از رودهای مرزی موجب بروز یا تسریع بحرانهای زیست محیطی و بلایای طبیعی ویرانگر از جمله سیلاب کاهش سطح آبهای زیرزمینی، خشکیدگی تالاب‌ها و دریاچه ها شده است. این وضعیت باعث شده است معیشت جوان به محلی تحت تأثیر قرار گرفته و به مرور ساکنان آن مناطق مجبور به مهاجرت داخلی بر کشور شوند. به عنوان مثال خوشسادی و شرایط ناشی از گرد و قبار موجب جابجایی داخلان داخلی شهروندان از مناطق جنوب شرقی ایران به دیگر مناطق کشور شده است افزون بر آن سیل مهاجرت در پی همین شرایط از کشور افغانستان به ایران تشدید شده و بار مضاعفی بر کشورم تحمیل نموده است اقدامات کشورهای همسایه در ایجاد بیرویه صد و عدم تأمین حقابه ایران از رودهای مرزی باعث خوش شدن دریاچه هامون در مناطق مرزی ایران با افغانستان شده است. علاوه بر این در زل قرب و شمال غربی ایران 
ایجاد سطح جدید بر رود عرس، دجله و فرات منجر به کاهش حجم آب رودهای مرزی در شمال غرب ایران، خوکسادی طالاب ها در عراق و ورود ریزگرد ها و گرد و خاک از غرب و جنوب غربی ایران است. این خود عامل دیگری برای تأثیر تقلیم اقلیم بر جابجایی جمعیت است. آقای رئیس، جمهوری اسلامی ایران در همسایگی با کشورهایی قرار دارد که آنها نیز با تأثیرات تغییر اقلیم و بلایای طبیعی روی رو هستند که نمونه مهم آن کشور افغانستان است. تأثیرات ناشی از تغییر اقلیم در این کشور به همراه چند ده خشونت و ناامنی پیامدهای مخربی را بر وضعیت معیشت و اقتصاد افغانستان داشته است. از سوی دیگر با وقوع زلزله مخرب در منطقه حرات افغانستان در اکتبر سال جاری شهروندان این کشور با وضعیت بقرنج اقتصادی و معیشتی روبرو شدند. در نتیجه این تحولات اقلیمی و بلایای طبیعی هزاران نفر از شهروندان افغانستان در جستجوی زندگی بهتر به سوی مرزهای حرکت کرده و مشکلات مهاجرتی در ایران را پیچیده تر کردند. علاوه بر تأثیرات تغییرات و آب و هوایی و بلایای طبیعی مردم ایران با بلایای ساخته انسان از جمله تحریم های یک جانبه نیز مواجه هستند. در چنین شرایطی طبیعی است که کشورم ظرفیت پذیرش مهاجران جدید به خصوص مهاجران اقتصادی را نداشته باشد. فشار بر زیر ساخت های اقتصادی و اجتماعی در مناطق مختلف کشور از جمله در حوزه تأمین مواد غذایی و آب، حامل های انرژی، اسکان، بهداشت، تحصیل و حمل و نقل به دلیل افزایش تعداد مهاجران خارجی تشدید شده است. در همین راستا پیشنهاد می گردد. حمایت های فنی و اقتصادی توسط جامعه بین المللی از کشورهای در حال توسعه که از یک سو در حال مواجهه با موج بیقاعده مهاجرت بوده و سوی دیگر تحت تاثیر تقلیم اقلیم و بلایای طبیعی هستند به منظور افزایش میزان تاب آوری و جلوگیری از جایی جمعیت تقویت شود همچنین جابجایی افراد از مناطق تحت تاثیر تقلیم اقلیم به کشورهای همسایه همسایه آنها که خود نیز مواجه با تاثیرات تغییر اقلیم هستند معقول نخواهد بود لذا باید قوانین و توافق نامه های دو جانبه منطقه ای یا بین المللی برای تسهیل مهاجرت اقلیمی به کشورها با تاثیر پذیری کمتر از تغییر اقلیم و بلاهای طبیعی مورد توجه قرار گیرد همچنین لازم است سازوکارهای بین المللی برای تضمین جلوگیری از تأثیر تحریم های یک جانبه بر عملکرد بشر دوستانه سازمان های بین المللی جهت کاهش آثار تأثیرات اقلیمی بر فرایندهای حمایتی در جوامع میزبان در جوامع میزبان مهاجران اتخاذ شود از توجه شما متشکرم. Thank you. Now I give floor to uh, Mr. Gonzalo Gonzalez Fierro, Vice Minister of Human Mobility of Ecuador. Ecuador, you have the floor. Apreciadas señoras y señores, el cambio climático es una realidad que está teniendo un impacto devastador en nuestro planeta. Los fenómenos meteorológicos extremos, el aumento del nivel del mar y la pérdida de biodiversidad son solo algunos de los efectos que ya estamos experimentando. Este cambio climático está provocando que millones de personas se vean obligadas a abandonar sus hogares en busca de un lugar seguro donde vivir. Según el Banco Mundial, para 2050 en América Latina y el Caribe se estima que podrán existir 26 millones de personas desplazadas por fenómenos ambientales. Según los datos del Sistema Nacional de Gestión de Riesgos del Ecuador, el periodo 2010-2020, alrededor de 70.000 personas en movilidad humana fueron perjudicadas por inundaciones y deslizamientos. Abordar los desafíos de la degradación ambiental y el cambio climático en el contexto de la movilidad humana significa facilitar el movimiento de personas expuestas a amenazas ambientales y climáticas, 
prevenir desplazamientos forzados y reducir la vulnerabilidad de la población en este tipo de migraciones con el fin de garantizar el derecho a una vida digna y el bienestar para aquellas personas en estado de vulnerabilidad. Por este motivo, el Ecuador ha incluido en su Agenda Nacional para la Igualdad de Movilidad Humana 2021-2025 la importancia de la relación entre movilidad humana y medio ambiente como un eje central para la transición ecológica, basado en la necesidad de incrementar la capacidad adaptativa de los medios de vida ante la ocurrencia de eventos climáticos extremos y de aparición lenta. Además, el Ecuador está comprometido a abordar este problema, Hemos ratificado el Acuerdo de París y estamos implementando políticas para reducir nuestras emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero. Trabajamos para mejorar la protección de los migrantes, especialmente de las mujeres y los niños. Una de las medidas más importantes tomadas por el Ecuador ha sido la denominada deuda por conservación. Esta iniciativa es una de las operaciones financieras y de conversión de deuda más innovadoras de la historia de nuestro país que consistió en la recompra de bonos de deuda externa para liberar recursos destinados a la conservación del medio ambiente, en este caso de la Reserva Marina de Galápagos. Otro punto para recalcar es el trabajo del Ecuador en el Plan Nacional de Adaptación al Cambio Climático, PLANAC, el cual es un instrumento fundamental para la integración de la adaptación al cambio climático en la planificación del desarrollo de Ecuador. Este plan reconoce que los impactos del cambio climático incluyen efectos sobre la movilidad humana, un fenómeno que tiene implicaciones significativas para la seguridad y el bienestar de las personas. El cambio climático está afectando a la movilidad humana en Ecuador a través de eventos meteorológicos y sequías, lo que ha provocado pérdidas humanas, desplazamientos y migraciones internas y transfronterizas, sobre todo con la presencia de los efectos devastadores del fenómeno del niño cuya fuerza destructora se va incrementando día a día. Este evento climático adverso aumentará en, forma, en el futuro cercano y afectará a los medios de vida de la población. Es importante para el Ecuador generar información, desarrollar capacidades y garantizar financiamiento para abordar estos desafíos y reducir la vulnerabilidad de la población que migra o tiene que desplazarse por motivos climáticos. Es importante que los esfuerzos de adaptación y mitigación del cambio climático consideren la protección y el apoyo a las comunidades que se ven obligadas a desplazarse debido a los impactos climáticos. Esto incluye el desarrollo de políticas y programas que garanticen la seguridad, la inclusión y el desarrollo de las personas desplazadas. El análisis de los problemas migratorios vinculados al cambio climático tiene que entenderse como una responsabilidad de los estados y sus gobiernos, la formulación y aplicación de políticas públicas debe enmarcarse en un contexto post-COVID-19. Sin lugar a dudas, la pandemia incrementó los problemas internos de cada estado y ha aumentado las desigualdades económicas entre los países. Esta problemática también se ve reflejada en la reducción de las capacidades nacionales para afrontar el problema climático y las crisis migratorias. Promovemos el principio de corresponsabilidad internacional, Agradecemos y valoramos los esfuerzos de la comunidad internacional, países donantes, instituciones financieras y otros organismos. No obstante, creemos que todavía tenemos mucho por recorrer en beneficio de los migrantes y las comunidades de acogida. La movilidad humana es compleja y exige una respuesta dinámica frente a los nuevos desafíos de los fenómenos migratorios que se vinculan al cambio climático. Es necesario el fortalecimiento de las estrategias conjuntas entre los países receptores, de tránsito y de origen de los migrantes como parte del principio de corresponsabilidad. Debemos alcanzar acuerdos que prioricen a la migración en la agenda de las organizaciones internacionales y particularmente de los cooperantes. Los efectos del cambio climático y medioambientales no son uniformes. Afectan de forma desproporcionada a los países y comunidades más vulnerables. El Banco Mundial calcula que para el 2050, si no se adoptan medidas en materia de clima y desarrollo, más de 143 millones de personas podrían verse abocadas al desplazamiento interno debido a efectos del cambio climático en el África subsahariana, Asia Meridional y América Latina. Insistimos en que es necesario realizar más investigaciones a efectos de comprender claramente las distintas repercusiones y su incidencia en la configuración de los movimientos de las poblaciones así como para fundamentar las políticas y las medidas a fin de atender las necesidades y los complejos retos que afrontan las comunidades más vulnerables a los efectos climáticos. 
El liderazgo del Ecuador en la defensa de la biodiversidad, la movilidad humana, el cambio climático y la necesidad de lograr una real transición ecológica ha sido reconocido por varios países alrededor del mundo. Ecuador tiene un marco normativo robusto y una institucionalidad que permite atender estos problemas. Es importante que todos nos comprometamos a tomar medidas para abordar este tema. Juntos podemos construir un futuro más sostenible y justo para todas y todos. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Anjablo uh, Anjuja, Deputy Minister of Home Affairs of South Africa. South Africa, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairperson. South Africa welcomes the focus of the high-level segment on climate impact on mobility, a call for solutions, and wishes to applaud the Director General for creating this platform. Climate change and mobility is a phenomenon that cannot be ignored nor avoided, as it knows no borders. This year alone, the world experienced extreme weather patterns such as cyclones, floods, droughts, wildfires, and earthquakes that destroyed infrastructure and agricultural production, which is an indication that no one is immune to the devastation of natural disasters that are disruptive to the livelihoods of persons. Sadly, Africa is also at the receiving end of these disruptions. South Africa and the southern African regions are not spared the disruptive effects of climate change. For South Africa, this contributes to internal displacement, food insecurity, and loss of life caused by severe weather patterns resulting in droughts and floods on the back end of El Nino and El Nina. In 2023 alone, South Africa has seen a decrease in crop yields, loss of livestock, and soaring food prices, as well as vector and web waterborne diseases growing in frequency and in intensity. Chairperson, as a signatory to the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, South Africa believes that the compact provides a base and articulates how member states should address cross-border mobility as a result of the adverse impact of climate change. Consequently, my country is of the view that the discussion on migration should support the existing dialogue on climate change and align itself with the United Nations framework for climate change, the Paris Agreement and its subsequent conferences. Yesterday, the Director General spoke on the importance of data collection and analysis to enhance the forecasting for appropriate early warning responses to reduce risks that may contribute to the loss of life. We could not agree more. Countries that are the most vulnerable to the environmental shocks are the least prepared. Earlier this month, South Africa hosted a group of Earth Observations meetings which gathered weather experts in government and other relevant stakeholders to discuss and build their capacity on how data can be used in addressing environmental challenges such as early warning systems. If nothing concrete and comprehensive is done, we will keep on taking from Mother Earth until she says, I have nothing to give. It is that day we must avoid, as this will exacerbate the worsening climate situation, resulting in further first displacement of people. My country is adding its miniature effort towards tackling this gigantic task facing human cuts. Our efforts include supporting the United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction Process. That in return, support member states to develop national plans and emphasize the importance of investment in the prevention and reduction of disasters. My government allocated 372 million rands, which was added towards the Municipal Disaster Response Grant and an additional 1.2 billion rands towards the Municipal Disaster Recovery Grant. This was meant to cover the repairs and rehabilitation of infrastructure damaged by floods in February and March in 2023. 
Further in line with the Sendai framework on disaster risk reduction, South Africa is in the process of finalizing the draft guidelines on humanitarian standards in humanitarian response, which is a collaboration between the National Disaster Management Committee and the Provincial Disaster Management Committee and other relevant national stakeholders to prepare for annual seasonal contingency plan. My country has to date drafted the climate bill, which is currently in Parliament for consideration. We are also undertaking comprehensive research to understand the linkages between migration and desertification, land degradation, drought, climate change, and other environmental factors. Notwithstanding, in the event of potential climate change induced mobility, South Africa has set bilateral mechanism with our neighboring countries. Therefore, Chairperson, we acknowledge that the nexus between migration, climate change, and the environment is complex in nature. The international community requires comprehensive approaches and intensive research to inform future global policy direction to build sustainable adaptation and resilient strategies. In conclusion, my delegation reiterates that we must enhance the capacity of state institutions as primary actors in the preparedness and response efforts, given that humanitarian needs are expected to increase due to climate change challenges as noted in Africa and other countries in the rest of the world. We need to increase investment in multi-hazard early warning and early response systems and prevention strategies focusing on disaster reduction. I thank you, Chair. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Kewal Prasad Bandari, Secretary of the Ministry of Labor, Employment and Social Security of Nepal. Nepal, you have the floor. Respected Chair, Director General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I congratulate Director General for this position and best wishes to lead the organization in due, new dimension. I am representing the Himalayan country, Nepal. It's diverse landscape from the southern plain to the top of the world in the north. Climate change is not a distant threat, but a current reality. Nepal's average temperature is increasing at the rate of 0.04 degrees Celsius per year, with a significantly higher in the mountain. Climate variabilities are a significant driver of food insecurity, displacement, and migration. Nepal's first recognized case of climate refugees in 2009 in Dehe village in Upper Mustang of the Himalaya region witnessed large-scale migration due to the acute shortage of water. Last census shows that over 5 million people internally migrated in a decade. Nepal is facing devastating loss, and li loss of lives and, lives and livelihood due to the climate change, experiencing too much and too little water, increased flooding, heat stress, and drought in the south, hills and mountains regions experience increased landslide, water stress, glacial retreat, and outburst floods. These climate-induced losses and damage continually impede growth and prosperity of nation. During his recent visit to Nepal, UN Secretary General highlighted the increasing force and ferocity of monsoons, storm, and landslide that are sweeping away crops, livestock, and entire villages, decimating economies and ruining lives. lives. He stressed the urgency of global climate action. Nepal has pledged to protect vulnerable people from climate change and set target to prepare and implement climate resilient and gender responsive adaptation plans by 2030. Nepal also adopted green, resilient and inclusive development grid approach for green growth and build resilience to climate and other shocks. Excellencies, Nepal needs to benefit from loss and damage fund. We look forward its operationalization, access to predictable climate financing to build resilience and enhance our adaptive capacity. We must ensure that our local governments, climate resilience development efforts equipped with resources, capacity, and knowledge to take the lead on climate change and human mobility.
Last fiscal year, 0.77 million Nepalis sought employment globally and remittances for equivalent to a quarter of GDP. With a substantial population overseas, the impact of climate change in our migrant workforce is paramount. Across the world, temperatures have risen significantly and soared to unprecedented. Nepali migrant workers are among the scores of outdoor workers in construction and agriculture are disproportionately exposed to extreme heat, which is an occupational safety and health hazard. In this context, robust occupational heat protections are critical to ensure safety, ensuring migrant workers workers have equal access to social protection and health care is crucial. Long-standing issues that migrant workers face, such as recruiting, recruitment fees, remittances fees, and wage abuses require effort to resolve, which ensure migrant workers maximize the benefit. As climate impact influences all aspects of human mobility, including migrants' decision to move, stay, or return, we reaffirm commitment to ensuring safe, orderly, and managed migration. Excellencies, the green transition presents opportunities and challenges across the world as government prepare and manage workforces for low carbon economy. There is a pressing need for more bilateral cooperation in research, training, and managed labor migration between country of origin and destination. This includes engaging with development partners private sector and civil society to create win-win outcomes to meet their climate change and SDG with the migrants' well-being at the center. Nepal has always prioritized bilateral labor agreement as a part of labor migration policy and implementing innovative skill development and labor partnership that will also promote climate action. We urge the IOM to facilitate such cooperation. At the time for action is now, need to work together, not just as a nation, but as a global community, to address the impacts of climate change and human mobility. I thank you all. Thank you. Now I give the floor Ms. Isabel Castro Fernandez, Secretary of State of, uh, for, for Migration. Uh, Spain, we have the floor. Gracias, Presidente, Directora General, Excelencias, queridos colegas y autoridades. Quiero empezar como país miembro de la Unión Europea recordando mi conclusión de ayer. Para España, la solidaridad, el respeto a los derechos humanos y la acción multilateral son vías claves para afrontar los retos y las oportunidades del fenómeno migratorio. Agradecemos la elección de la temática de este foro que encaja en una de las cuatro prioridades de la Presidencia Española del Consejo de la Unión Europea avanzar en la transición ecológica y la adaptación medioambiental. Somos conscientes de que junto a las causas tradicionales de la migración hay que sumar el efecto que produce el cambio climático. Fenómenos climáticos extremos, incluidas inundaciones, olas de calor, sequías e incendios forestales, así como los desafíos climáticos de evolución más lenta, como el aumento del nivel del mar y la intensificación del estrés hídrico, fuerzan a miles de personas a abandonar sus hogares. Sin embargo, al igual que con las otras causas que provocan la movilidad, nuestro enfoque hacia la migración tiene en cuenta sus dimensiones humana, económica y social. Desde hace 20 años, para España, uno de los ejes vertebradores de nuestra política migratoria ha sido fortalecer la cooperación con los países de origen y de tránsito en la gestión responsable de una migración segura, regular y ordenada. En los proyectos e iniciativas que desarrollamos conjuntamente en este marco, junto con el enfoque de género, el enfoque climático es cada vez más un elemento de base considerando en todas las fases de implementación, consiguiendo que los migrantes puedan, a su vez, ser agentes de cambio y desarrollo en sus países de origen y en los países de acogida. Nuestros proyectos tienen un claro objetivo, que todas las partes implicadas salgan beneficiadas. El país de origen, porque lograr formar a sus jóvenes y trabajadores que después retornan y aplican lo aprendido, estimulando el desarrollo socioeconómico regional del país. También el migrante, que a través de estos proyectos adquiere unos conocimientos y habilidades de los que antes carecía. Y nosotros, que mediante el impulso de programas de migración con terceros países, fomentamos la circulación de migrantes. 
me gustaría compartir con ustedes dos proyectos en los que el enfoque climático es fundamental. El primero es el proyecto Guafira de octubre del 2021 a octubre del 2024. Guafira en árabe significa abundancia y ha sido el segundo proyecto piloto de migración legal presentado entre España y Marruecos, cofinanciado por la Unión Europea. El proyecto consiste en la capacitación a las mujeres temporeras que cada año vienen a España desde Marruecos a la campaña de la fresa para que su regreso a Marruecos puedan poner en marcha actividades generadoras de ingresos, gracias además al apoyo financiero y técnico que les ofrecerá el proyecto. Son un total de 250 mujeres. Para las formaciones en España se ha contado con el apoyo de cooperativas agroalimentarias de Andalucía, que recibe a varios miles de trabajadores cada año. Además de cooperativas agroalimentarias, son socios del proyecto la OIT y ANAPEC, el Servicio Público de Empleo Marroquí. Si bien par también participará por parte de Marruecos el Ministerio de Trabajo e Inserción Profesional. El segundo proyecto del que quiero hablarles es el MigraSafe África. Es un proyecto de migración legal desarrollado en el marco de la red ILO de la Comisión Europea, cuyo programa bienal de trabajo contempla como una de las prioridades de la red mejorar el conocimiento de las vías de migración legal para los consulados europeos y las autoridades locales competentes de en terceros países, así como los de los propios oficiales de enlace. Se implementa en ocho estados africanos, Marruecos, Senegal, Túnez, Cabo Verde, Nigeria, Ghana, Egipto y Etiopía. El proyecto, que tendrá una duración inicial de 24 meses, desde enero del 22 hasta enero del 24, consiste en la capacitación de distintos actores acerca de las vías de migración legal a la Unión Europea, de tal manera que tanto las fuentes de información formales como las informales tengan la información correcta y actualizada que puedan transmitir a potenciales migrantes. En definitiva, para el Gobierno español, también respecto a los efectos climáticos sobre la migración, hay que priorizar respuestas multilaterales que pongan al ser humano en el centro del debate. Gracias por su atención. Thank you. Now I give the floor Mr. Aliu uh, Tijani uh, Ahmed, Federal Commissioner, National Commission for Refugees, Migrants and Internally Displaced Persons of Nigeria. Nigeria, you have the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Your Excellencies, let me congratulate the Director General of the IOM, Mrs. Amy Pope, as the new DG of the IOM, and also appreciate our own. Mrs. Oguche Daniels, DD Operations. Let me acknowledge the timeliness of the discourse on the impact of climate change of human mobility, particularly the global call for solutions. Debates on climate change induced displacement and human mobility have become a topical and essential at multiple multilateral fora, such as the Conference of Parties and the Global Forum on Migration and Development. Quite certainly, the delegation of Nigeria has continued to register deep concerns on the growing impact on nexus between climate change and human mobility, particularly the grave threat to existing challenges and the creation of new ones. We are witness to extreme weather events in form of recruiting floods, reoccurring floods, droughts, wildfire, and hurricanes, and accompanying severe destruction across the globe. The estimation is that at the end of 2023, unaddressed and growing incidences of drought will affect at least 700 million people globally. Would with sea level rising between 30 cm to 60 cm by 2100. In the lectured basin region, for instance, desertification has adversely impacted lives, livelihood activities, and living condition of communities. In 2022, Nigeria witnessed unprecedented flooding across 33 states resulting in extensive damage to nearly 360,000 homes, more than 1 million hectares of farmlands, and displacing about, displacing about 5 million people. 
This disaster, together with security concerns, have impeded the progress envisaged in our national development. For internally displaced persons and vulnerable migrants, particularly children, persons with disabilities, women and elderly persons, such a path is often practiced or is, is often practicated and invariably leading to additional vulnerability. Objectives two of the Global Compact on Safe and Orderly Migration, GCM, highlights the need for countries to take concrete steps toward adoption and resilience strategies to address the effects of sudden and slow onset of natural disasters. As humanitarian and protection needs increase, our government is focused on livelihood empowerment and building resilience for climate shocks. It is against this backdrop that Nigeria has made significant investment in the Special National Economic Livelihood Emergency Intervention to support vulnerable groups of persons impacted by disasters to advance timely post-disaster and socio-economic recovery. This is done with a view to ensuring that durable solutions are implemented in a humane and orderly process that leaves no one behind. While it is evident that the decision to migrate is anchored on a number of cross-cutting dynamics, including conflicts and socioeconomic factors, it is equally pertinent to highlight the, currently the impact of climate change continues for, to, to force large populations to move within and outside countries. It is on this premise that our government has put in place a three-faced climate change adapt adaptation project. First, to access the vulnerabilities and the capacity of communities. Secondly, to implement community-based adapt adaptation project and to include at-risk groups in the larger social, social investment schemes dedicated to poverty alleviations. Indeed, a victim support fund has also been established to provide short-term relief and solutions to human displacement. Furthermore, and anchored on the need to employ ad addition and adapt adaptation strategies to meet our commitment under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Nigeria is implementing the National Adaptation Strategy and Plan for Action on Climate Change Policy. For instance, the ongoing reclamation of the land lost to coastal erosions in Lagos through the Eco Atlantic City project and the canoe relocation project to relocate at least 800 households in flood prone areas where cases in point. Nigeria's 2015 national migration policy also acknowledged the impact of climate change and environmental degradation on population distribution and human mobility. This policy, which is currently under review, has its focus on addressing climate change induced mobility and integrating innovative solutions by conducting relevant studies. Mr. Chairman, my delegation notes the compelling need to mainstream deliberations on disaster risk management to ensure that global financial facility within the context of multilateralism is made accessible to developing countries, less developed nations, and small island states. I must recall objective 23 of the GCM, which emphasizes the importance of threatening international cooperation and sees the opportunity to call on member states to redeem commitments on climate action and financing, particularly the loss and damage fund. Nigeria remains a committed partner to IOM in the execution of this mandate. I thank you. <coughs> thank you. Now I give the floor to Her Excellency uh, Liz Valentina Kazakova, Chief of the General Administration for Migration Issues of Russian Federation. Russia, you have the uh, floor. 
Уважаемый господин председатель, уважаемая госпожа генеральный директор, уважаемые дамы и господа, являясь полноправным членом Международной организации по миграции, Российская Федерация в полной мере использует потенциал МОМ для выработки решений по вопросам миграции, формирования сбалансированных подходов к упорядочению миграционных потоков, а также совершенствования качества их регулирования. Участие в мероприятиях, проводимые под эгидой МОМ, позволяет выстраивать и наращивать конструктивный диалог с другими государствами на миграционном направлении. Анализируя, перенимая, внедряя передовой опыт зарубежных коллег, государства члены МОБ не только получают возможность совершенствовать механизмы регулирования миграционных потоков на национальном уровне, но и укрепляют международные взаимодействия в сфере миграции. Отмечаем, что проводимые организации исследования и программы, направленные на извлечение максимальной выгоды от процесса миграции, способствуют экономическому и социальному развитию государства. Помощь странам в вопросах адаптации и интеграции мигрантов в новых для них условиях и вовлечение представителей диаспор в решение миграционных проблем также рассматриваются в качестве весомого вклада в комплексную работу по миграционной проблематике. Исходим из того, что основной вектор в развитии современных подходов к международной миграции задается глобальным договором о безопасной, упорядоченной и легальной миграции. Положение данного документа находит свое отражение в концепции государственной миграционной политики Российской Федерации. В первую очередь это касается сохранения принципа открытости России для иностранных граждан, рассматривающих наше государство в качестве страны с благоприятными условиями для удовлетворения своих экономических, социальных, и культурных потребностей, обеспечение простых и прозрачных механизмов для осуществления трудовой деятельности, создание равных возможностей для получения государственных услуг в сфере миграции, оптимизации административных процедур, использование современных цифровых технологий. Убеждены, что ключевую роль в формировании и реализации эффективной миграционной политики в соответствии с национальными интересами играет нормативно-правовое обеспечение государственных механизмов регулирования миграционных процессов и совершенствования законодательной базы. Миграционные потоки несут не только положительный потенциал, способный придать импульс экономическому, социальному и демографическому развитию стран, но и сопровождаются большими рисками. Стремительное увеличение количества мигрантов ставит перед всем мировым сообществом новые угрозы и вызовы. Таким образом, одной из важнейших задач любого государства является повышение эффективности деятельности компетентных органов в данном направлении. В этой связи Российской Федерации ведется планомерная работа по совершенствованию миграционного законодательства нашей страны. Так, последние изменения затрагивают вопросы правового положения иностранных граждан на территории России, систематизированные подходы к регулированию отношений, связанных с приобретением и прекращением гражданства Российской Федерации, повышенная эффективность миграционного учета иностранных граждан. Граждан. Россия постоянно осуществляется широкая информационная кампания для разъяснения иностранцам порядка пребывания на территории нашей страны. Уверены, что предпринимаемые нами меры в положительном ключе влияют на повышение миграционной привлекательности нашего государства. Господин председатель, на сегодняшний день большинство стран мира оказались перед лицом стабильно увеличивающихся климатических и экологических вызовов. Обусловленная целыми комплексом причин мобильность населения вследствие воздействия изменений климата и деградации окружающей среды в современных реалиях является предметом обсуждения на национальном и международном уровнях. Российская Федерация реализует следующие меры. Проведение аналитической работы с целью прогнозирования возникновения очагов климатической и экологической миграции, неотложное реагирование государственных структур на климатические вызовы, дополнительное финансирование и создание целевых фондов для поддержки уязвимых категорий мигрантов. Это, несомненно, находит свое отражение при формировании политики адаптации к изменению климата и в определенной степени в разработке новел миграционного законодательства. Господин председатель, в заключение хотелось бы отметить, что решение оперативных задач в области миграции на уровне государств является залогом успешной и стабильной миграционной ситуации во всем мировом сообществе. Донесение до международной общественности ключевых достижений в сфере создания цивилизованных каналов миграции и упорядочения миграционных потоков должно быть лишено политизированной подоплеки и двойных стандартов. Высоко оцениваем накопленный МОМ опыт по решению всего спектра миграционных вопросов и полагаем, что организации впредь в своих подходах будет руководство общепризнанными гуманитарными принципами гуманности, нейтральности, беспристрастности и независимости. Благодарю за внимание.
uh, I'll give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Ki Hwan Kwon, Deputy Minister for Multilateral Global Affairs of Republic of Korea. Korea, you have the floor. Director General, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, I would like to begin by extending my congratulations to Director General Amy Pope on her inauguration. Her historic appointment as the first female leader marks a significant milestone in the history of IOM. The Republic of Korea looks forward to collaborating with Director General Pope in advancing the IOM's critical mission of ensuring humane and orderly migration. As we gather today, we stand at an inflection point. The international community is grappling with a crisis of an unprecedented scale, exacerbated by the effects of climate change. The rising sea levels and extreme weather events we witness today are more than an environmental phenomenon. They herald a looming displacement crisis of the magnitude the Secretary General Guterres has described as biblical. Last year alone, natural disasters displaced over 32 million people. This accounts for more than half of the world's internally displaced. These numbers speak to the stark reality of the human cost, families losing livelihoods, communities being uprooted, and centuries-old cultures being put at risk. Therefore, the urgency to strengthen international cooperation to meet the challenge of climate-induced migration has never been greater. In this regard, our efforts to combat climate change must be complemented by comprehensive strategies to effectively manage the resulting migration. We must ensure that displaced populations receive the necessary supports to rebuild their lives. Proactively anticipating and addressing the multifaceted challenges of climate-induced migration is also critical. In these efforts, we should engage proactively with a broader range of stakeholders. The Sustainable Development Goals have galvanized actors across sectors with the resources, innovative technologies, and expertise. It is imperative that we mobilize and coordinate such resources to ensure that human mobility is an integral component of sustainable development. Korea is fully committed to this global effort. We are significantly increasing our humanitarian assistance to mitigate the impacts of disasters and conflicts. In line with our commitment to enhancing the resilience of partner countries, Korea will scale up our green ODA to exceed the OECD DAC average by 2025. President Yoon Song yeols recent pledge at the G20 summit to contribute $300 million to the Green Climate Fund underscores our dedication to a sustainable, shared future. We also plan to share renewable energy and high-efficiency, carbon-free energy sources with the countries vulnerable to climate change. Through these initiatives, Korea aspires to become a green ladder drawing on the lessons learned from our journey towards economic growth and democratization. As we prepare for our upcoming term on the UN Security Council next year, climate security will be a key priority. We aim to enrich Council deliberations with meaningful data and insights on climate-related security dynamics. Let me conclude by encouraging IOM to continue its important work of raising international awareness and tackling the complexities of climate migration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Ms. Jennifer McIntyre, Assistant Deputy Minister of International Affairs and Crisis Response of Canada. Canada, you have the floor.
Monsieur le Président, Excellence, je m'adresse à vous Je m'adresse à vous depuis Kamloops, en Colombie-Britannique, au Canada. Je voudrais commencer par reconnaître que la terre sur laquelle je me retrouve, c'est le territoire du peuple autochtone, Tekumloops Tekusue Pemkuluk, sur les terres ancestrales non cédées de la nation Sukwe Pemkuluk, dont les relations historiques avec la terre se poursuivent encore aujourd'hui. J'aimerais commencer mon allocation en félicitant la directrice générale, Amy Pope, pour son nouveau rôle à la tête de l'organisation. Le Canada se réjouit de poursuivre son partenariat avec l'OIM dans les années à venir. En nom du gouvernement du Canada, je tiens à exprimer notre gratitude pour l'occasion de discuter des défis posés par les conséquences des changements climatiques sur la mobilité humaine et de chercher des solutions collectives. L'augmentation de la fréquence et de la gravité des catastrophes environnementales est une préoccupation croissante. Le Canada n'est pas à l'abri des effets des changements climatiques. Ces dernières années, les Canadiens et les Canadiennes ont été confrontés à des phénomènes météorologiques extrêmes. En 2023, des feux de forêt d'une magnitude sans précédent ont ravagé plus de 18 millions d'hectares, touchant les 13 provinces et territoires du Canada et qui ont déplacé des personnes et menacé des communautés. Des vagues de chaleur, chaleur ont touché la plus grande partie du Canada, même l'Arctique dans le nord. Dans l'ouest, c'est la sécheresse qui nous a affectés. Dans l'est, des ouragans et des inondations ont endommagé ou détruit des habitations, des entreprises et des infrastructures Essentiel. Canada souligne la nécessité d'une action urgente en matière de la mobilité humaine induite par les changements climatiques et appelle à des solutions fondées sur des données probantes et axées sur les droits de la personne pour faire face à la réalité des personnes qui restent au pays, ceux qui se déplacent ou ceux qui sont contraintes de se déplacer. Le Canada apprécie le leadership de l'OIM qui favorise la coopération et veille à ce que les conséquences humaines des changements climatiques soient prises en compte dans tous les secteurs. Migration, protection, développement, aide humanitaire, paix et action climatique. Ceci est particulièrement évident lors de la prochaine COP28 à Dubaï, où le thème de la migration et du déplacement sera plus important. Investments in climate adaptation is one of the key actions that states can take to address climate-induced mobility. Adaptation is essential for those who want to stay, and it can also make migration a choice rather than a necessity, allowing people to move with dignity. In 2021, Canada announced a doubling of its overall international climate finance commitment to $5.3 billion from 2021 to 2026, with the objective of spending 40% of this commitment on adaptation. This includes efforts to diversify livelihoods and strengthen the capacity of governments and communities to live with the shocks and pressures such as though through investments in climate smart agriculture and infrastructure. Canada is also investing in projects that aim to strengthen data in the evidence base related to climate mobility, given the importance of further deepening our understanding of who is on the move and people's considerations in deciding whether to move. 
thorough understanding of why people move can help inform and enable the development of adequate local solutions and targeted adaptation strategies and increase resiliency. In particular, Canada encourages a gender responsive approach that factors in systemic and intersecting inequalities in order to reduce risks that disproportionately affect women, LGBTQI plus persons, children, and others facing vulnerability due to intersectional factors. The importance of having gender responsive migration pro programs and policies is well established as they lead to more effective outcomes. With climate change and its impact on human mobility, this need to incorporate gender and inclusion is even more pronounced. Decision makers will benefit from robust data and analysis, including disaggregated and intersectional data and analysis, to better understand the dynamics of climate-induced human mobility. Canada looks forward to the findings and outcomes from international cooperation among data experts, researchers, and practitioners, including from IOM's GLODA Global Data Institute. Mr. Chair, we appreciate the IOM's commitment to climate mobility and to collaborative efforts across humanitarian development and peace sectors. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Council today. Thank you. Now I give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Rodrigo Donoso Maluf, uh, DG of Concerned Affairs, Immigration and Chileans Abroad of Chile. Chile, you have the floor. Buenas tardes. Como no iniciar esta intervención felicitando en nombre de Chile a la señora Amy Pope, primera mujer en asumir como directora general de la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones. Chile recibe con beneplácito esta elección, confirmando nuestro compromiso con una política exterior feminista. Estamos seguros que su liderazgo será determinante en el trabajo de sus equipos para promover una migración humana, segura, ordenada y regular. Cuente para ello con el apoyo comprometido de Chile, señora Pope, en los próximos años. Los éxitos de la OIM serán también los nuestros. Asimismo, felicitamos a la presidenta del, de este 114 avo Consejo de la OIM, la embajadora Catarina Stasch, y extendemos nuestros agradecimientos al gobierno de Suiza como país anfitrión de este Consejo. Chile, por supuesto, también afronta las consecuencias del cambio climático con graves implicancias en cuanto a pérdida y daño para sus comunidades. Lo anterior viene acompañado también de nuevos retos, como es el incremento de los flujos de movilidad humana, hoy más complejos por su naturaleza multidireccional y dual. En nuestra región hemos realizado esfuerzos para enfrentar tales desafíos a través de plataformas regionales. Como usted bien sabe, Durante el año 2023, durante la presidencia pro tempore del proceso de Quito, Chile insistió en abordar la vinculación de los desastres naturales y migraciones. En función de lo anterior, sostuvimos la conferencia regional sobre movilidad humana y cambio climático en Bogotá, Colombia, a principios del presente mes, con el objetivo de promover un espacio para intercambiar experiencias y levantar sinergias regionales en vísperas de la COP28. Anteriormente, durante el año 2022, periodo en que Chile ejerció la presidencia pro tempore de la vigésima Conferencia Sudamericana de Migraciones, impulsamos la red de trabajo sobre migración, medio ambiente, desastres y cambio climático. De esta forma avanzamos en un plan operativo para crear una estrategia regional de desarrollo humano para las migraciones. Con el resto de los Estados miembros de la CSM, consensuamos también el primer posicionamiento conjunto de la Conferencia Sudamericana de Migraciones con, ante las conferencias de las partes de las Naciones Unidas sobre el Cambio Climático en el marco de la COP27. 
Chile ha estado implementando medidas para anticiparse, adaptarse y mitigar los devastadores efectos del cambio climático. Lo anterior incluye potenciar a las comunidades locales, el rol de la inversión en energías renovables o incentivar la planificación urbana resiliente al clima o la implementación de estrategias para abordar los impactos sociales del cambio climático de la movilidad humana. Estos esfuerzos están siendo impulsados por Chile conforme a la llamada política exterior turquesa comprometida con el medio ambiente, enfocando la acción climática desde una perspectiva multidimensional, es decir, que incluya tanto los componentes tradicionales de, de la protección al medio ambiente terrestre como la protección de los ecosistemas marinos. En otras palabras, deseamos transversalizar la dimensión medioambiental en consideración a los ecosistemas terrestres y el océano, pero además sumar una estrategia de transición socioecológica justa, promoción de los derechos humanos y de equidad de género. Esto último está incluido también en nuestra política exterior. La Política Nacional de Migración y Extranjería de Chile, presentada en julio de 2023, incorporó un eje temático destinado a dar respuestas a emergencias, catástrofes y desplazamientos surgidos por el cambio climático. Por otra parte, nuestro Servicio Nacional de Prevención y Respuesta ante Desastres en Chile ha generado espacios significativos como la Mesa Interseccional de Movilidad Humana en contexto del cambio climático y el riesgo de desastres, elaborando un documento intersectorial conforme a lineamientos internacionales ratificados por Chile en la materia. También debo destacar el reciente viaje al continente antártico del presidente de la República, Gabriel Boric, junto al secretario general de Naciones Unidas, señor Antonio Guterres, quienes en terreno constataron el impacto del cambio climático en esos territorios. Hoy más que nunca necesitamos una cooperación internacional sólida, coordinada y colaborativa, porque solo de esa forma podremos desarrollar políticas oportunas y eficaces que brinden apoyo y protección a las personas afectadas. Siempre debemos tener presente un enfoque de derechos humanos, que enfatice resguardar la dignidad de todos y que garantice que nadie quede rezagado. Solo mediante un esfuerzo conjunto desarrollaremos respuestas efectivas, equitativas y sostenibles en el tiempo orientadas a proteger a las personas en, en situación de movilidad humana y a los ecosistemas afectados. Concordamos plenamente con la instrucción de la directora general en la utilización de datos fiables que nos permitan elaborar políticas migratorias sobre la base de evidencia científica, libre de sesgos ideológicos, orientadas a entregar respuestas oportunas, justas y eficientes. En lugar de limitarnos a solo reaccionar, estamos conscientes que es nuestro deber actuar proactiva y prospectivamente, por cuanto cada vez más los principales motores de la migración son generados por conflictos de pobreza y cambio climático. Al interior de su organización solicitamos, señora eh, directora general, continuar fomentando la distribución geográfica equitativa, de forma que las regiones estén debidamente representadas en la Secretaría de la OIM, haciendo valer sus legítimas preocupaciones e intereses. Por su magnitud y naturaleza, estos desafíos globales solo pueden ser asumidos multilateralmente, si es que deseamos soluciones oportunas, eficaces y justas. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Now uh, I'd like to give the floor to Mr. Riteshi Sarizoe, the Permanent Secretary for Environment of Suriname. Suriname, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As Suriname take the floor for the first time, we'd like to extend our gratitude to the IOM for organizing the 114th session of the Council of Migration and congr congratulate the new General Director. Her energy brings new dimension to the work of the IOM. <clears throat> As we convene at this council meeting, it is imperative that we recognize the link between human mobility and climate change. Therefore, it is very important to take actions to combat the impacts of global warming and, the clim and climate change and the responsibility we bear to make the world more climate-friendly 
and resilience for the future generations. Tsunamis forests are of global importance, both as a biodiversity hotspot and a carbon sink. The efforts to protect its natural resources are key to the country's commitments. Suriname maintains its contribution as a high cover and low deforestation country, committed to maintain 93% forest cover. Significant international support is needed for the conservation of this valuable resource perpetuity. Suriname's forests store approximately 20 million ton CO2 and it's one of the carbon negative countries. On the other hand, Suriname is a low-lying coastal state prone to natural disasters and climate change. According to estimates, a one meter sea level rise would have impact on 80% of its population who lives along the low-lying coast. Moreover, indigenous and maroon communities are also at risk. Considering the economic situation and location in remote areas where extreme drought and floods has been recorded in the past. Vulnerability assessments, including impact assessment and climate scenarios, have been conducted, leading to some proposed associated adaptation measures for the following sectors energy, water resources, agriculture, cross cutting, including biodiversity and forestry. It is time for action, bold, decisive, and immediate. We call upon the international community to mobilize the necessary resources for adaptive adaptation finance. Developing countries like Suriname has been affected by the effects of climate change, subsequently requiring adequate assistance to build resilience, implement sustainable practices and adapt to the infinite changes that climate change brings to us. Adequate and accessible funds, funding mechanism must be established to support adaptation actions at the local, national, and international levels. This includes investment in early warning systems, infrastructure resilience, capacity building initiatives. The global community must fulfill its commitments to mobilize climate finance, recognizing that the cost of inaction far exceeds the cost of adaptation. I thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Mr. Mukuteshi uh, K. Pardeshi, Secretary, Ministry of External Affairs of India. India, you have the floor. Mr. Chairperson, let me begin by extending our felicitations to Ms. Amy Pope on her appointment as the new DG and wishing her all success in leading IOM. We are assembled here to discuss a matter of global significance, the impact of climate change on human mobility. One of the strategies that people may use to cope with the adverse effects of climate change is to move for survival and in search of livelihoods. It can take the form of internal or cross-border movements, giving rise to further questions about national security, pressure on limited natural resources, burden on infrastructure, and in extreme cases, may also give rise to conflicts. As we acknowledge the realities faced by communities on the front lines of climate-induced displacement, it is only through shared knowledge, resources, and a commitment to common goals that we can pave the way for a more resilient and sustainable future. It is imperative that we prioritize and develop policies which are inclusive, encompassing the needs of the vulnerable populations who are disproportionately affected by the consequences of climate change. While challenges are significant, they also present opportunities for innovation and 
collaboration. In India, we are gradually moving towards that goal through global solutions that prioritize sustainable development, renewable energy solutions, and climate resilient infrastructure. Two such initiatives which I would like to mention here are Mission Life, launched by Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the G20 summit in September, and the adoption of a Green Development Pact by G20 leaders. We are also committed to promoting green jobs. India has played an active role in the development of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, and has been committed towards fulfilling its objectives through existing as well as new innovative initiatives. India has the largest diaspora population in the world, over 32 million. We are also the largest recipient of remittances. Well-managed migration is hence our national priority. The government of India has devised key legal and institutional mechanisms and programs for the empowerment and social protection of immigrants. They are the Immigration Act of 1983, e-migrate platform, which is a one-stop source of information on overseas employment, Indian Community Welfare Fund, which is managed by all our Indian missions abroad for assisting Indians in distress, insurance scheme for all departing workers, skill enhancement program, pre-departure orientation training, 24 by, help, 24 by 7 help centers, and active diaspora engagement schemes. At the same time, the government has focused on improving the presence of highly skilled workers and professionals through mutually beneficial arrangements with countries all over the world. We are committed towards further strengthening skills and competencies of our immigrants to ensure greater mobility, employability, and readiness to contribute to the global workforce. India has been cooperating with several countries through bilateral agreements to improve mobility governance. India commends the role and contribution of the IOM as the primary global migration management organization. We align ourselves with the objectives of the IOM as well as its various program projects and events. In this spirit of supporting the core objectives of IOM, India has proposed two issues which have already been included in the program governance and organizational priorities of IOM. I would like to thank IOM for this. These two issues are way forward on social security portability and identifying global skill gap. Under India's G20 presidency, which concludes later this week, G20 leaders have committed to address skill gap and ensuring inclusive social protection policies for all. India stands ready to contribute actively to collaborative global efforts, recognizing that only through vigorous data analysis, fostering international dialogues, and close cooperation can we effectively address the impact of climate change on human mobility. The road ahead is challenging, but with collective determination, we can forge a sustainable and resilient future. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now I give the floor, Mr. Abraham K. Mendy, uh, Deputy Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of the Interior of Gambia. Gambia, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Chair. <clears throat> Chair, may I take this opportunity to congratulate Madam Pope for her new position and wish her well with her team. Uh, Director General, may I bring to your attention that uh, 
your office in Banjul are doing great in complementing government efforts in addressing uh, migration, particularly in the borders. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Gambia government, my delegation wish to express sincere appreciation to the donor partners and IOM for convening the high-level segment of the 114th session of the Council on the team, Climate Impact on Human Mobility, a Global Call for Solutions. We also wish to express our appreciation for facilitating the participation of the developing countries to this session. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this is an opportunity for us as member states to discuss critical solutions to respond to challenges relating to human mobility, displacement, migration, and climate change crisis. The Gambia supports the promotion of innovative approaches to increase availability of labor mobility pathways for inclusive and prosperous societies. On that note, we thank IOM for their thought-provoking on the theme of the high-level segment. Excellencies, the impact on climate change crisis is devastating such that it forces mass displacement of population, renders large geographical areas inhabitable. It is also the leading cause of environmental degradation, destruction of essential infrastructures, civil unrest and conflict. The negative impact of climate change exacerbate and accelerate these drivers of migration and traps people in risky environments. Climate crisis further exposes countries and their population to vulnerable situations, especially developing and least developed countries. In the Gambia, adverse effects of these changes on, are felt on agriculture, forestry, fisheries, tourism, just to name a few, and amplified and accelerated by saline intrusion into arable lands with attendant losses in productivity of land resources, water, nutrients, and segment uh, uh, fluxes. The Gambia adopts its national migration policy in 2020 and align it with several policies, such as the Gambia's national security policy, key regional and global frameworks, including uh, migration policy framework for Africa, global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration, and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And as we speak, the Gambia and EU-Gambia partnership are now working on the development of a migration strategy with costed programs. As part of its ratification of the Paris Agreement, government of the Gambia is committed to consolidate its fight against climate change by integrating identified mitigation measures into national planning process. Accordingly, we formulated a Green Recovery Focused National Development Plan 2023 to 2028 to strengthen the government's uh, mainstreaming of climate change adaptation across all levels of government. Therefore, the Gambia wishes to encourage more international cooperation and increase funding to support 
the ecosystem-based adaptation in developing countries to enable the provision of natural based, nature based solutions that will help people and communities survive and thrive under circumstances uh, and thrive under circumstances of predictable pattern of uh, climate change. Protect the environment and protect and, and facilitate development of sustainable natural resource based economy. Chairperson, Excellencies, to conclude, we, we call on partners and IOM to increase technical assistance to developing, developing and least developed countries on a large scale eco-based adaptation with a view to solve mitigated threat to agriculture, food security, economic growth, and avert the dangers of climate change on human livelihood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I give the floor His Excellency uh, Madudu Isaac Akaji, Deputy Permanent Secretary of Ministry of Home Affairs of United Republic of Tanzania. Tanzania, you have the floor. Dear Madam Chairperson, I have the honor to deliver this statement on the behalf of United Republic of Tanzania. And first of all, we would want to congratulate you, Director General Amy Pope, on your election for being the Director General of the IOM. We wish you all the best. I wish to express our sincere appreciation for the invitation to participate in this important forum that brings together state and non-state actors to mitigate the impact of climate change on human mobility. Chairperson, in East Africa, specifically Tanzania, studies have revealed that drought, severe rain cycles have become more prevalent, frequent, and regular, as well as intensive, due to the global climate change and the environmental degradation. These affect mostly the pastoralist and semi-pastoralist communities in the region and in Tanzania in particular. The impact of climate change to human mobility must be addressed jointly in order to enhance full implementation of the objectives of the Global Compact on Migration and guarantee a safe, orderly, and regular migration. Chairperson, the United Republic of Tanzania recognizes that the responsibility for every state to protect the international migrants affected by climate change must be emphasized. This should be done in their countries of origin, on transit, and upon reaching their final destination. Madam Chairperson and Director General, in order to realize protection as such, we should strive to review and align our policies and practices to reflect regional and international standards for the provision of maximum protection and support to whoever is affected by the climate change by guaranteeing their safe and dignified entry, stay, and passage into our countries. Chairperson, while impl implementing such measures, agreeably, there is a need to strengthen data collection systems and conducting research on effects of uh, climate change to migrant mobility and sharing best practices globally in order to have informed and scientific decision making. And in such a way, we can have effective policies which are sustainable and as well uh, as strategic responses. We therefore appeal to the IOM and other UN agencies to continue strengthening their responsiveness to climate change, which is affecting mostly African continents, as well uh, specifically Tanzania. We also uh, recognize, we, we also advise on assisting member states in strengthening resilience of communities 
facing such disasters. Finally, Chairperson, the United Republic of Tanzania assures its commitment in supporting and implementing initiatives and programs in place, both short run, medium, and long term, in order to mitigate the impact of climate change on human mobility at the regional and international levels. Madam Chairperson, I thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> now I give the floor to Ms. Cristina Probst Lopez, Head of International Cooperation of State Secretary for Migration. Switzerland, you have the floor. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Directrice Générale, Excellences, chers collègues, les accords internationaux tels que l'apport de Paris sur le climat jouent un rôle décisif en créant un cadre juridique permettant d'aborder les défis liés au changement climatique, y compris son impact sur la migration et les déplacements forcés. La mise en œuvre effective de ces accords et la traduction des engagements pris par des actions concrètes demeurent cependant un véritable défi. Face à la complexité des effets et aléas liés au changement climatique, mais aussi à la multitude d'acteurs impliqués dans la gestion de ce phénomène, une coordination internationale et une excellente coopération des multiples acteurs concernés, que ce soit au niveau national, régional, mais aussi global, est impérative. Les agences onusiennes comme l'OIM jouent un rôle crucial dans la facilitation de cette coopération en fournissant une plateforme pour le dialogue, en aidant à développer des solutions concertées et à les mettre en œuvre. Nous saluons le fort engagement de l'OIM sur cette thématique complexe et l'assurons du soutien continu de la Suisse. La Suisse est sensible aux enjeux liés à la migration induite par les conséquences du changement climatique. En 2012 déjà, conjointement avec la Norvège, nous lancions l'initiative Nansen, dont l'objectif était d'améliorer la protection des personnes contraintes de quitter leur pays en raison de catastrophes naturelles et des conséquences négatives du changement climatique. Dans le cadre de la plateforme sur les déplacements forcés liés aux catastrophes, la Suisse s'engage toujours activement pour une meilleure protection des personnes contraintes à fuir au-delà des frontières dans le contexte des catastrophes naturelles et du changement climatique. Permettez-moi ici de partager trois aspects sur lesquels nous mettons l'accent dans le cadre de nos programmes de coopération internationale. Tout d'abord, accroître la capacité d'adaptation et renforcer la résilience pour adresser de manière préventive les effets croissants du changement climatique, renforcer les connaissances sur le changement climatique et garantir un accès à l'information sur les options de mobilité. Deuxièmement, Mettre l'accent sur la protection des personnes affectées par le changement climatique y inclut les migrants, en particulier les femmes et les filles. Pour terminer, inclure les acteurs locaux. Selon notre expérience, ce sont les acteurs sur place qui sont le mieux placés pour identifier les besoins des personnes déplacées et les intégrer dans la mise en œuvre de solutions. J'aimerais terminer par remercier à nouveau l'OIM pour son engagement sur ces questions essentielles et vous assurer du soutien de la Suisse dans le cadre de l'élaboration de solutions communes et inclusives. Merci de votre attention. Thank you. Now I give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Nurudan Aeroplat Altun Tas, Director General of Consular Affairs of Turkey. Turkey, you have the floor. Mr. Chairperson, Madam Director General, Excellencies, as climate change and environmental problems have become one of the most challenging global crises we have to face, we believe that this high-level session is very timely. Regardless of the development level, no country is immune from the negative effects. Climate change is causing loss of land and livelihoods, environmental degradation, food insecurity, water scarcity, and impacting women, girls, and vulnerable populations the most. We need to act immediately for the climate emergency, which we are all facing in the form of environmental catastrophes. Climate change is a risk multiplier that is threatening social and economic stability of nations. 
In this regard, with a holistic approach, the impact of climate change on migration shall rather be addressed within the context of sustainable development agenda. As we all know, the adverse impacts of climate change and environmental degradation represent a serious threat to the achievement of the SDGs. As we aim to leave no one behind, we need comprehensive and collaborative actions. We need to break the silos to achieve our common goals. Excellencies, most vulnerable people and countries should be prioritized in combating climate change and strengthening their adaptation. They need to adapt faster and build resilience as they have no time to lose. In this regard, combating climate change is no longer a choice, but a necessity for us. Due to the ongoing political instabilities, poor governance, armed conflicts and economic hardship in the region, Turkey has been under heavy migration pressure from her neighbors and countries of the region. As known, Turkey is located in the Mediterranean region, which is one of the main climate change hotspots in the world. We have been experiencing extreme weather events more frequently. With this understanding, we gave momentum to our efforts on climate action. We doubled our greenhouse gas emission reduction target in our updated nationally determined contribution. We announced our net zero emission target for 2053 and our new green development reform. We are preparing our climate law to combat climate change more efficiently. We are also updating the climate change action plan, long-term strategy and adaptation strategy and action plan within the context of our net zero target and green transition. Turkey demonstrates leadership within the scope of the Barcelona Convention on the Protection of the Marine Environment and Coastal Zone of the Mediterranean and makes significant contributions to the protection of the Mediterranean. We are ready to contribute more to the global efforts on addressing environmental challenges, especially climate change, loss of biodiversity and waste management on the basis of sustainable development and green transition. In terms of waste management, Turkey took a significant step forward by introducing the Zero Waste Project initiated by our First Lady, Her Excellency Emine Erdogan, to the world by the UN Zero Waste Resolution this last year. Excellencies, as enshrined in the GCM, we, if we want to be successful in our efforts, we need to work together. We need to promote international, regional and bilateral cooperation and dialogue. There is no doubt that Strengthening international cooperation and global partnerships for safe, orderly and regular migration should be our aim. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor Mr. Florent Tingarde, Buruguma, Director General of Burkina Faso Abroad, Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Directrice Générale, distingués participants, permettez-moi de saluer la tenue effective de ce débat de haut niveau sur l'appel mondial en faveur de la recherche de solutions contre les effets des changements climatiques. Monsieur le Président, de toute évidence, les changements climatiques constituent de nos jours une réelle menace pour l'équilibre de notre planète. Ils font partie des facteurs qui exacerbent la mobilité humaine sous toutes ses formes. Mieux, la dynamique de la dégradation continue du couvert végétal, due aux facteurs climatiques et anthropologiques, occasionne le départ des populations vers des zones aux conditions environnementales et climatiques plus favorables. Le Burkina Faso, pays sahélien au cœur de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, n'échappe pas à cette donne qui demeure l'une des principales causes de la mobilité de ces populations. C'est en raison de ce constat que le Burkina Faso a activement soutenu en août 2023 à Nairobi au Kenya l'élaboration de l'extension continentale de la déclaration ministérielle de Kampala sur les migrations, l'environnement et le changement climatique qui a abouti à l'adoption et à la signature d'un addendum par l'ensemble des États membres de l'Union africaine. Monsieur le Président, 
En raison de sa vulnérabilité croissante au changement climatique, et ceci aggravé par les attaques des groupes terroristes, mon pays compte à ce jour 2 millions de personnes déplacées en tête. En ratifiant l'accord de Paris sur le climat, mon pays s'est résolument engagé à réduire ses émissions de gaz à effet de serre, tout en renforçant la résilience de ses populations au changement climatique. À cet égard, il me plaît de signaler que mon pays a déjà adopté un document cadre de contribution prévu déterminé au niveau national à l'horizon 2030 qui définit notre stratégie nationale de lutte contre les effets des changements climatiques. Cette stratégie nationale comprend une composante d'atténuation des émissions de gaz à effet de serre et une composante d'adaptation grâce aux investissements dans les secteurs vulnérables en vue de renforcer la résilience du pays face aux changements climatiques. Monsieur le Président, la problématique posée par les effets des changements climatiques sur la mobilité humaine n'est pas nouvelle. Sous l'égide de l'Organisation internationale pour les migrations, cette question a pu, de manière constante, a pu retenir de manière constante l'attention de la communauté internationale en joignant à la table des discussions toutes les parties prenantes. Elle a souvent fait l'objet d'échanges enrichissants desquels des recommandations fortes ont été adoptées, dont le principe du partage des responsabilités découlant de la mise en œuvre effective du Pacte mondial sur les migrations sur ordonnées et régulières. Monsieur le Président, il est de notre responsabilité collective de parvenir à anticiper les changements à court, moyen et long terme sur le climat, la sécurité alimentaire et la mobilité humaine en identifiant les zones à fort risque pour passer d'une adaptation réactive à une prise de décision anticipative. Pour ce faire, nous avons besoin de renforcer notre collaboration au niveau régional et international afin d'améliorer la disponibilité et la qualité des données pour nous permettre d'avoir de bonnes prédictions ainsi que des analyses prospectives de qualité. Il nous revient également de renforcer les capacités locales et les mesures d'adaptation à long terme dans les secteurs de l'agriculture et de l'élevage pour promouvoir la résilience des populations locales et renforcer la sécurité alimentaire en tant que facteur d'atténuation des conflits et des déplacements futurs. Monsieur le Président, c'est le lieu pour moi de féliciter l'OIM qui, en tant que principal agent du système des Nations Unies chargé des migrations, est aujourd'hui en première ligne des efforts opérationnels sur la recherche et la sensibilisation pour placer la migration environnementale au cœur des préoccupations internationales, régionales et nationales. Au Burkina Faso, nous travaillons avec l'OIM pour l'intégration des questions migratoires et environnementales au niveau des collectivités territoriales. Nous espérons poursuivre cette collaboration fructueuse car il est aujourd'hui crucial d'intégrer les migrations climatiques internes dans un cadre de planification prospective orienté vers une transformation structurelle à même de renforcer la résilience des, des communautés les plus affectées en recherchant des solutions durables à leur situation. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Now we move to the uh, Ms. Uh, Celeste Drake. Deputy Director General of International Labour Organization. Uh, DDG Drake, you have the floor. Thank you. Excellencies, Director General Pope, Mr. Chair, colleagues from UN agencies, and friends from civil society, thank you for this opportunity to intervene on this extremely important topic. Climate change is already affecting human mobility, including labor migration, and it's not a future threat, it's a current threat. Well-governed human mobility can work hand in hand with adaptation and mitigation efforts while protecting the rights of those displaced. Poorly governed mobility, on the other hand, that fails to account for increased pressures on vulnerable populations, 
will lead to unsafe, disorderly, and irregular movement, maladaptation, and rights abuses. Rights-based governance of human mobility in the context of climate change is therefore vital. Decent work underpinned by, by workers' rights as outlined in international labor standards is central to rights-based governance. Just transitions away from fossil fuels toward green economies and societies are key to the future of work. Migrant workers who can develop and use appropriate skills in the green sector can play a central role in just transitions to green economies and societies if their rights are protected. At the same time, protecting labor rights and developing skills for all, both migrant and non-migrant, will help build the support needed for national policies to address and adapt to climate change. For many people, mobility in the context of climate change will look like labor migration, with people diversifying their incomes, sending remittances, and strengthening the adaptive capacities of their families and communities of origin. For these people, the core values of respect for fundamental principles and rights of work, fair recruitment, and decent work will be needed for them to realize these goals. For those displaced by climate change, decent work is crucial to help rebuild their lives with dignity. ILO Recommendation 205 on Employment and Decent Work for Peace and Resilience provides guidance to prevent and mitigate crises, enabling recovery and building resilience, highlighting the critical role of decent work in building resilience and rebuilding after disaster. In all these efforts, social dialogue with employers and workers' organizations is critical. These World of Work actors have key insights on capacities, needs, and opportunities for just transition, adaptation, and relocation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the ILO considers human mobility in the context of climate change a key social justice challenge. In response to demands from our tripartite constituents, we are developing knowledge, taking action on the ground, and strengthening partnerships to help people move with dignity and in respect of their rights. Our constituents discussed just transitions during the 111th International Labor Conference in June and called for the development of coherent labor migration and mobility frameworks for just transitions. We have been working in countries with the support of the Migration Multi-Partner Trust Fund to support pilot projects in partnership with the IGAD Secretariat, the IOM, UNHCR, the Platform on Disaster Displacement in East Africa and the Pacific, and many others. We are also colleagues in the UN Network on Migration Workstream on Climate Change, the GCM and the Paris Agreement, and participate in the UNFCCC Task Force on Displacement, strengthening the complementarities between discussions on climate change and the migration process. And we're ready to do more. We will continue to push this agenda forward, strengthening partnerships within the UN system and working with our tripartite constituents and other stakeholders to ensure that people on the move due to climate change enjoy decent work, and an enabling environment for sustainable enterprises, as well as they can contribute to adaptation and just transition. Without this critical element of social justice for people on the move, there can be no just transition. And if the transition is not just, our efforts face greater risks than we can imagine. Without decent work, migration cannot work for adaptation or rebuilding after catastrophic loss and damage. And without social dialogue, we will never understand the full extent of how migrant workers can support just transitions. But together, employers, workers, and governments, we can address the climate challenges we face while promoting social justice and decent work. Thank you. Thank you. Now I give the floor. Uh, Her Excellency, Ms. Elizabeth Taylor J, Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs of Colombia. Colombia, you have the floor. 
Thank you so much, Chairman. Muchas gracias. Un saludo cordial a todos y todas los distinguidos colegas que nos hemos dado cita aquí en este importante escenario. Deseo iniciar esta intervención con una sentida felicitación a la señora Amy Pope por el inicio de sus funciones como directora general de la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones el pasado mes de octubre. El gobierno de Colombia quiere aprovechar esta oportunidad para manifestar todo nuestro apoyo y desearle los mejores éxitos en su gestión al frente de la OIM. Nuestro gobierno está profundamente agradecido con la organización por su constante apoyo para enfrentar, entre otros, los constantes desafíos para el manejo de los flujos migratorios, pero también del apoyo para el fortalecimiento de la política pública en la materia, que en últimas contribuye con nuestra aspiración de paz total. Nos complace participar en este segmento de alto nivel relativo al nexo entre migración y cambio climático, organizado por la OIM, dos temas indiscutiblemente prioritarios para mi país, que además trasciende fronteras y que ya implica un reto para el presente y no para el futuro, como en algún momento se pronosticaba. Siendo los países de América Latina, incluido Colombia, uno de los más vulnerables a nivel global. El sexto informe de evaluación del Grupo Intergubernamental de Expertos sobre el Cambio Climático, IPCC, de las Naciones Unidas, reconoce los efectos adversos del cambio climático y sus vínculos con el desplazamiento y migración en todas las regiones de nuestro planeta. Las cifras son dramáticas. El último informe del Centro de Monitoreo del Desplazamiento Interno del 2023 señala que, para las Américas, el número de personas desplazadas internamente por motivo de desastres en 2022 se estima en más de 2 millones, de los cuales Colombia representa 281 mil, la segunda cifra más alta desde el año 2008. Colombia como país bioceánico, con costas en el Caribe y en el litoral pacífico que se extienden en su conjunto por más de 4.000 kilómetros, así como la región insular, ya están experimentando los impactos adversos del cambio climático, incluyendo, entre otros, la erosión costera y la misma amenaza existencial del evidente aumento en el nivel del mar. Por otro lado, y en relación con la variabilidad climática, desde mediados del 2023 nos venimos preparando para hacer frente a los efectos del fenómeno del niño que puede verse exacerbada con el cambio climático, incluyendo posibles sequías prolongadas en algunas regiones de nuestro país que nos han obligado además a tomar medidas tempranas de precaución y alerta. Sin embargo, este es un fenómeno que puede producir afectaciones a cientos de miles de familias, incluyendo tanto los eventos climáticos extremos como los de lenta evolución, así como la degradación ambiental, afectan directamente los modos de vida de las comunidades y sus fuentes de sustento incluida la seguridad alimentaria y nutricional, convirtiéndose así en motores de migración y desplazamiento. A medida que empeoran los impactos del cambio climático y aumentan los desplazamientos, necesitamos innovar y ampliar las fuentes de financiación concesional para abordar sus efectos negativos. Debemos evitar el aumento de las pérdidas y daños colaterales, para lo cual se deben garantizar que las promesas de financiación climática se cumplan mediante la movilización de fondos dedicados a la adaptación y a la mitigación. Desde Colombia estamos totalmente comprometidos a impulsar la agenda internacional en temas de movilidad humana y cambio climático, bajo el convencimiento de que la región posee elementos significativos para aportar al proceso de negociación 
de la COP28 que está muy cercana. Por esta razón y con el ánimo de generar insumos y coordinar esfuerzos para el fortalecimiento de la integración de la movilidad humana en las discusiones globales, nuestro país en alianza con la OIM el pasado 7 y 8 de noviembre fue sede de la primera conferencia regional sobre movilidad humana y cambio climático en la que participaron 25 países de América Latina y el Caribe. Aunado a lo anterior y de la mano del gobierno mexicano, desde el mes de junio del presente año se viene liderando la realización de un encuentro de alto nivel sobre migración y desarrollo, el cual tiene como propósito propiciar un diálogo a nivel regional con el fin de abordar de manera conjunta e integral los flujos migratorios mixtos en la región, evaluando sus causas incluyendo el cambio climático, los desastres naturales, efectos y tendencias democráticas, demográficas, así como los factores de desarrollo que influyen en las tendencias migratorias. Esta reunión tendrá lugar durante el primer trimestre del año 2024. Concluyo esta intervención reiterando que como país champion del Pacto Mundial para la Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular, Colombia seguirá asumiendo las oportunidades y retos de la migración desde una perspectiva de solidaridad y del pleno respeto por los derechos humanos. Hacemos entonces un llamado para que fortalezcamos la colaboración y la cooperación entre nuestros países sobre la base de la responsabilidad compartida, con un diálogo abierto que nos permita gestionar la migración de manera articulada y que nos permita atender sus causas profundas, incluyendo el cambio climático. Muchas gracias por esta oportunidad. Thank you. Now I give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Kairat uh, Saribei, Secretary General of Conference on Interaction and the Confidence Building Measures in Asia. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, you have the floor. Distinguished Chair, Honorable Delegates, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. At the outset, let me convey my gratitude to the International Organization for Migration for giving me the opportunity to deliver a statement on such a pivotal theme. The Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Measures in Asia, SICA in short, is a unique consensus-based multilateral platform for enhancing cooperation towards promoting peace, security and stability in Asia. Today, SICA brings together 28 member states which covers 90% of territory of Asia and more than half of the world's population. The SICA provides member states with an equitable platform to exchange ideas, disseminate knowledge, and engage in collaborative efforts across five overarching dimensions, military political, emerging challenges and threats, economic, environmental, and human. SICA's environmental dimension, together with sustainable development, environment protection and natural disaster management priority areas, contribute to the goal of SICA from an environmental perspective. Environmental problems in Asia, driven by climate change, pose unprecedented challenges to our region. These challenges, in turn, led to climate migration, displacing millions of people and aggravating socio-economic vulnerabilities. Climate migration has manifested in numerous ways in Asia. For instance, millions of people have been displaced due to floods in South Asia. To effectively address these issues, regional and international collaborations are not just beneficial, they are essential. SICA, with its diverse membership and platform for dialogue, is well positioned to facilitate cooperation and foster trust among Asian nations. Besides, SICA can build consensus on regional strategies to manage environmental problems, minimize their impacts, and mitigate the necessity for climate migration. In order to increase the awareness of SICA member states, various seminars, workshops, expert meetings, and online trainings are conducted under the SICA environmental dimension. 
The discussion generally focuses on green transformation, current problems of the region, environmental resilience, circular economy, sustainable development, and risk reduction management. Member States find value in sharing their experiences to collectively address environmental challenges. In 2022, during the Six Sikha Summit, President Qasim Jomar Tokayev of Kazakhstan put forward several initiatives to strengthen further cooperation in the environmental dimension, which include holding a high-level environmental conference in Astana in 2024 to identify environmental issues and develop coordinated solutions within the SICA framework. Dear participants, climate change is a global issue and its impacts transcend borders. Climate-induced migration can contribute to conflicts and insecurity. It can strain the economic and social fabric of both sending and receiving areas. International cooperation and solidarity are critical to protect the planet. SICA is committed to continuing its cooperation with international partners to make a meaningful difference in the lives of those affected by climate-induced human mobility. I thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was the last speaker of the day. Thank you again for the all speakers who participated in this segment for uh, enriching and uh, thought, thought provoking discussion. Before I close this item, I would like to give the floor to the DG for her closing remarks. DG. Thank you very much. And first of all, just a very warm and heartfelt thank you to all of you, um, and especially those of you who have traveled from afar to be here in person with us today, and those of you who joined us virtually from all over the world. I think it's clear to everyone in the room that um, the scale and the severity of climate change is one that simply cannot be ignored, and the impact of climate in terms of the displacement, particularly of vulnerable communities, is one that should lead us all to take very urgent action. Um, it's important that we have the reflections. It's important that we have the individual experiences. It's important that we recognize the vulnerab vulnerabilities of particular communities. But every single part of the world, whether we're talking about Albania or Australia, Bahamas to Bahrain, uh, Korea to Zimbabwe, all across the world, we are witnessing the impacts of climate on human mobility. We've heard from countries like Bangladesh, Somalia, several small island developing nations, and other countries who are facing some of the most severe impacts of climate change. And as mentioned by so many of you, but including Burkina Faso, Gambia, Guyana, the Philippines, Antigua, and Barbuda, the pre-existing vulnerabilities aggravated by reversing development gains often push people into a place where they are forced to make what is really an impossible choice. Do they stay in a life-threatening environment or do they move when they have absolutely no guarantee of what will come next, including of being safe or in a stable situation? And clearly, across the board, we're hearing from all of you, this is not a situation that we can accept as a global community. I've also heard from many of you that this is not a challenge that any country can manage alone. We know that many of the countries that are facing the worst impacts of climate change are the countries that have contributed the least to those impacts. And we really need to build a global, unified response to the situation, one that is based on rights, one that is based on the respect for human dignity, but one that also recognizes that when we use migration as a means of adaptation, we can actually realize quite significant benefits for multiple communities. We can truly make migration work for all. And we saw that um, as I started at the very beginning with the example we recently um, heard, uh, learned of from Tuvalu and Australia and negotiating their agreement in the leadership of uh, Uganda and Kenya in driving forward the Kampala Declaration uh, within the Americas where we're hearing um, uh, increasing efforts to consolidate action on a regional basis. 
I also heard from many of you, including Germany, Japan, the United Kingdom, Canada, about the importance of focusing on the unique vulnerabilities of certain groups of people, whether we're talking about women, young people, um, indigenous populations, people who have disabilities, the impacts of climate on human mobility are not the same for everyone. So as we build solutions, we need to do them taking into account the unique protection concerns, but also the unique um, vulnerabilities and capacities that people might have, recognizing that sometimes what we see as a vulnerability is also an opportunity to drive more significant change. Now, we started the conversation by recognizing the need to save lives, and we all have acknowledged that there are millions of people every single year who are being impacted by disasters, and that is across the board, no matter whether you live in a, um, a high-income country or a lower-income country. The question is really about how do we build resilience and how, when, how do we respond when countries or communities do not have the resilience they need to face the impact of climate change. We've seen that climate adaptation is thus linked to migration. So when we talk about how we bring solutions for people to live safe and dignified lives, we must do so with the idea of giving people as much agency as possible, enabling them to stay at home where that's possible or to choose to migrate in safe and regular circumstances where they have uh, appropriately paid work, where their rights as workers are protected, where they're not exploited. And I thank the, um, our colleague from the International Labor Organization for her very thoughtful interventions on, the, on that point. We also know we cannot reverse the damage that has already taken place, but we can work together to make sure these impacts do not get worse. And so we at IOM join the chorus of voices of organizations around this UN family, urging states to create this new fund on loss and damage that will cover the gaps that we know exist. These are gaps that we are seeing play out in real time, particularly when it comes to issues like access to water, water scarcity, water flooding, uh, desalination of water. Water is at the heart of so much of these conversations, and particularly we know both fuels conflict, but also can be exacerbated when we're dealing with communities that already have faced conflict in the past. We also have recognized, and I thank the government of the Philippines for acknowledging the importance of building out more regular uh, pathways for persons. And I want to acknowledge the Philippines as well for the effort they've put in to really implementing the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And and creating a department that focuses on protecting the rights of workers um, who are going uh, across the world to, to work. And particularly in the face of the climate vulnerabilities that that country is facing. This is a good model that is relevant to many, many countries. And as eloquently said by the governments of Zimbabwe, Botswana, Guyana, the Netherlands, and the EU, as well as many others, climate finance must be made available to those who are the most vulnerable. Now, I hear this across the board wherever I travel, and particularly when I am speaking to smaller nations. Their ability to access climate funds is, is very much challenged. Some of it is bureaucracy, some of it is complexity, some of it is having the skills and the capacity to put together the proposals, but we are failing on this point. And if governments do not have resources to help their communities adapt, then we know that the cost to everyone, both in terms of finances, but also in terms of human lives, will be much, much higher. So across the board, we urge every government, 
all of our partners within the UN agency family, all of our partners within civil society to put climate impact in the work we do, whether it's on migration management, labor migration, migration policy, development goals. And the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration gives us a blueprint for how to do this. So the good news, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, is that you have already done the hard work. You have already put together a document that gives us a way forward. So our goal is now to find ways to implement, to put action behind the words. We also have put together a climate mobility roadmap, and we are creating these climate mobility innovation labs in Africa and in Asia. And the goal here is not to get stuck in old ways of doing things. We know that this is a challenge that is new, that requires innovative thinking, that requires the input, especially of young people who will be the most impacted. But we want to bring together the best minds, the best ideas, the best energy, so that we can build solutions. Start small, we think big, we start small, and then we scale up when we know it works. And we ourselves within the International Organization for Migration are going to put our money where our mouth is um, to build the tools, to work with the tools that now exist so that we can do a better job of helping all of you take action before your communities are displaced. Now, COP28 is later this week. After this um, session, con the council concludes tomorrow afternoon, I will be getting on an airplane to head out to COP28. I know some of your governments will also be there. And I look forward to the conversations that will happen there, but we recognize that conversations are not enough. What we really want is action. So I take this moment to recognize the great work that has happened to date, but I also take it as a moment where we measure the baseline. And we say next year, when we come back together, we want to demonstrate that we have advanced. I don't care about your advancements in rhetoric. I want your advancements in action. And that is a, a goal for all of us. It is a challenge for all of us within this community to set for ourselves. And we're looking for action that enables people to stay, enables people to move in, with dignity in safe and orderly ways, and to support people who have already been displaced, who are already on the move. We will be ready. Now, in the meantime, I invite you all to join us for a reception, to celebrate all of you, to thank all of you for your investment in this work and in this organization and in the communities, um, especially those that are the most vulnerable. And for those of you who want to test your medal against a four-time Olympic gold medalist, I invite you to a 3K fun run tomorrow morning at 7.45 <laughs> at the Parc de la Perle du Lac. 7.45, Sir Mo Farah will be there, and I'm going to have my running shoes on. So I welcome each and every one of you. If you're up for the challenge, come on over. 7.45, we'd love to see you. And I look forward to seeing you soon at the reception. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, uh, thank you very much for the delegation for participating in this discussion. I'm going to be very brief, so <laughs> wait for just a second. Uh, tomorrow morning, we'll continue with the general debate, uh, starting at 10 o'clock uh, in the morning, a.m. And uh, one public message, allow me to call, mention that uh, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., a side event on the Darien Gap. Yeah, Darien Gap, organized by the, the Permanent Mission of Panama, will take place uh, in room four of this building. And they say that the copy will be offered to participants. And uh, as, you, as just DG uh, explained, mentioned, there will be reception organized by the, the Swiss Federal Council, Swiss Council of the Republic, of, Republic and Canton of Geneva, and the Executive Council of the City of Geneva. <laughs> Please join the reception. Thank you. Recording stopped. Yeah. Well, that's the end of the, the meeting today. Let's go to the day. <laughs>